over a bit of the, uh, I have a list of a couple of natural building techniques, I guess, that we'll cover, like a, in summary or an overview of what it entails. Maybe you'll pick up a couple things out of it too. Um, uh, um, and it's funny, in natural building, to, like, you'll talk about a house, like it's a straw bale house, or it's a light clay house, or it's an aircrete house. But a house is much more than the insulation or the wall panel, right? Like, like sure, you have straw bales, but you have, you have a foundation, you have, like, your floor, you have a roof, a metal roof, like, are we saying, like, I live in a metal roof house, or, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's something, like, specific that we like about the natural materials to the point that we're describing the entire structure based on that. It's mm -hmm. not just Serena, right? It's very, we like it. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I guess, back in history, that's all we had too. Um, and so we had to come up with ways to, to use it. And then um, there's a bit of a thing with the, the natural building, like, you've experienced already, but there's that uh, that little triangle, and you can only only pick two out of three inside that triangle. So there'll be uh, time, there'll be money, <laughs> and then there's quality. So if you can only have two out of the three, which one are you going to get? So if you want it to be cheap, like is it going to take you a lot of time if you want to have high quality? You know, so you can, that's the, that's the, uh, the relationship between the three here. Like if you want something that's really high quality, but that doesn't take a lot of time, well, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> so that's, that's a little like, uh, so, the trade-off with the natural material, if you want to save, on the, usually we'll want to save on the money. But then, if you want to have your high quality, like it, it's going to take more time. And so, when you go to the hardware store, and you exchange your 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 cash, your currency, your fiat money for uh, for some building materials, well, someone already put in that time for you. Like the plant, the factory, the workers at the factory, like the miners, like all of that time has already been put. That's you're just changing their time for your money. They've already processed the material, they screened it, they standardized it, they made it into a panel, uh, they worked out the recipe so then it's the same consistency every time. Every time you pick, a, pick up a gallon of paint, it's the same color, same consistency, or same. So there's that trade-off there. Um, so you can <laughs> so money or time, or the quality. Um, or if you don't want the quality, you'll buy like you know it'll be it'll be cheap. You'll buy you'll get uh, reclaimed building materials. But sometimes anyway, there's still a bit of trade-off. Like you gotta sort through the material yeah, or true. clean it or so um, or it's bro it's damaged or. <laughs> It's rot is the defects to it, so uh, there's a bit of a yeah. You kind of have that, and you decide. That's that's a a, a quick way to start, like up with your project. Keep that in mind. Okay, um, and so some of the building materials that that we have that we already know, whether it be wood. That's <laughs> we're surrounded with wood. Okay. So how do we use wood in a in a home? It's already it's already part of the building code. It's already like two by fours, two by six, two by tens. The frame. The frame. Uh, we use it for <laughs> we use it for everything. Wood is floor. Floor. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, then you you peel it like toilet paper, and you make ply veneer, and you make plywood out of it with the glue. And you make toilet paper. And then you can make toilet paper with the wood. <laughs> so wood is a great resource. It's very abundant. Um, it's not necessarily sustainable depending on the harvesting and the techniques. And then, 
So there's a bit of that too, right? Uh, it's getting better, and because like there's, I don't know, I guess we, there's been a lot of migrations of civilization over time because they would clear, they would use all the wood resource that they had, and then they needed more ships for for invading the next country, so then they would then invade another country so they could get the wood for, to build their ships to get and invade the next country and travel across the world like that. So like that's been so wood wood that's well known. We know how to work with that very well. Um, uh, um, uh, what else do we have? We have uh, well, okay. Well, with the wood, you can make a log home, uh, which is. Uh, you just cut the tree. <laughs> All right, wait, well, again, like high level uh, overview, you cut the tree here, like you remove the bark. If you leave the bark on, it's just gonna create problems and like it's habitat for the bugs, which would naturally go behind the bark. So you remove the bark. It's gonna flake off over time anyway, and it's quite visually unpleasant. <laughs> you remove the bark and then there's a uh, different kind of notches depending on the, the, the size of the, the logs, the wood, and the skill level of the, of the builder. Um, you, you notch the four corners and you build up your square. You can make, I mean, that would be rudimentary, but then you can make like fancy log homes, uh, million dollar log homes nowadays um, uh, uh, with quite detailed uh, joinery, which would shed the water. Uh, the, 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 with a log home is the shrinkage of the wood. Over time, there's gonna be cracks, air cracks between the logs, depending on your notches, which then you fill with chinking or moss or uh, a, 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 a chicken manure or whatever you can stuff in the cracks to keep, your, keep the air from coming in. Uh, uh, or you can always, also use the wood for timber framing. So you make like a big sturdy frame to keep your roof up. And then uh, you can put whatever you want underneath there. As in, that's that's my preference for sure. And that's, I mean, I, I have a college degree in computer science. And then uh, after seeing Dick Pronicky and his uh, adventures in Alaska, I was like, I want to do this. I wanted, I wanted to build my own home. And I retrained as a timber frame carpenter so I could build my own home someday. So nope. very, very big proponent of timber framing as a, as a framing material and then you can put whatever you want underneath once you have like a and it's also part of the building code compliance and the engineering too they know wood right. like they have the tables and the charts and the span for wood members so that's that's an easy way to go about it you, if you use wood uh, that's that's a more sure way to achieve, achieve new success uh, Leo had a question first. Well, I, was, I was wondering if you knew anything about cordwood, because isn't that another way of wood? Cord, like, uh, yeah. Cordwood? Yeah. Um, yeah, so cordwood, if people don't know about that, it's... Um, I don't think I got the cordwood book, because like, I have less less appeal with it. There's right. um, So you're using uh, wood rounds, like uh, depending on the length of your... the thickness you want your wall to be. Like it's almost like your firewood. Instead of splitting it, you use it as a brick material. Oh, and then you put concrete in between. The you put a, a mortar in between. Concrete is is different than than the mortar in the, some of its properties, uh, but it's very very similar. <laughs> so you you would do that. The the uh, the challenge with cordwood um, is the the durability of it and the longevity. So you want you need your logs, your rounds to be very cured and seasoned, so that there's no more wood movement. Because and you want to keep it bone dry all the time, because if it rains or if you're in a high moisture environment where the moisture humidity fluctuates a lot throughout the year, there'll be swelling and uh, shrinkage of that wood, which will eventually crack your mortar joints and then over time it kind of fails so that's the challenge with cordwood yeah so it's not ideal for this environment i have not to live in like it's 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 super beautiful though like the the patterns that you can get depending on the size of your rounds and you make uh so there's there's beauty to it 
and uh, but then, then uh, that's that's the one caveat of cordwood though. Yeah, Crystal. Oh, I was just I had a kind of a random question, but it was uh, like if we were in a situation where you know <clears throat> it's a little bit more difficult to. Um, mill and so we're doing it sort of like the pioneers <laughs> right i'm just like curious what that scenario would look like what is the most efficient way of using wood to frame because i guess we'd probably be using logs right yeah so it'd all be about like the angles that you're cutting it or i'm just curious so what. well you, you could like like a log home come back like a log home which is kind of like cordwood too in a way in some ways but it's not an efficient use of wood because you need a lot of wood to build the entire structure. Right. Um, plus, the insulation value of it is so they, they qualify wood as like R1, so which means uh, one unit of insulation per inch of thickness. So if you want, if you have a 16 inch log, that's an R16 wall, but try to find like how many 16 inch logs are you going to be able to find and move around and build and now, now with code compliance, which is getting like more strict and more strict, they're shooting like for super high, high efficient targets, like you'll need 30 inch logs if you want, but then anyway, there's other point systems and you, know, you can cheat with your, a more insulated roof and more insulated slab and still get like the efficiency out of your house. So, um, so you would use the, the logs more as a timber frame post and beam scenario mm -hmm. as your posts and your, your beam members. You can use uh, hand saws and cross cut saws and two man saws and axes. Like uh, that's, that's kind of like my dream. Eventually I want to go in the forest and fall trees and have a like, horses and bring them back in and like have my, I have my big ewing axes and everything and I just want to use the, the beams myself and build up my my little like thing but it's again it's <laughs> it's, it's gonna be a lot of time um, yeah um, so that would be one way to go about it uh, and wood yeah so like uh, the insulation value of wood it's not great it's not terrible it's all about like the use of it too, but there's other materials for insulation that you would pref you would use uh, 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 preferably. So then I would I would put wood more as a structural um, element versus uh, insulation. Okay. Um, straw bale. So, so straw bale, so that came about from memory like 120 or 50 years ago when the machinery, the equipment uh, came about that they could make actually compact bales that were like uh, mechanized bales. Um, and then you can use it in two ways. You can have a load-bearing wall and a non-load-bearing wall. Uh, with the load-bearing, they would call, they could even call it Nebraska style. So if you've looked, or maybe you've heard the name. So Nebraska style, it's a load-bearing straw bale wall, which means that your roof is supported on the, is sitting on the straw bale. Um, the risk with that is that over time your straw bale will sag and shrink, and then your roof will shift and move, which then, who knows what else can, can result for that. Even failure, if, it's, if your straw bales get really wet, it could lead to failure even. Um, and it's doable, there's uh, many examples of that around, but for durability purposes and uh, to streamline the, 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 the code uh, aspect of it, I would definitely say get a wood frame or get, get a frame, a proper frame, steel, concrete, wood, and then 
your roof is supported on that frame, and then you use straw bale as infill, as your insulation material. Um, uh, um, with, uh, with timber framing, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later too, uh, when we go into insulation, but um, let's see. Let's say these would be like my timber frame uh, posts that uh, do over my foundation. It's plan view, a little X detail. <laughs> um, so, sure, you can put your, your straw bales in between. It depends how you want to finish your house too uh, at some point. You can put your straw bale in between each member here. And the straw bale goes right on the foundation or on the floor? So it would go on the floor, but as with any um, foundation to wall element, depending on your foundation, you want to prevent, um, what's the word here? Wicking of moisture. Mm -hmm. You want a, a, a capillary break is the, is the word. Oh, okay. You want to have a capillary break. So even if your concrete or your foundation is damp or wet, moisture cannot migrate through your straw bale or any wall for that matter. There's a, uh, for, for, for conventional buildings, it's a sill gasket, it's called. It's a styrofoam oh, right. strip that, that you sense. spread everywhere around and then your, your wall sits on that. So you would do something like that. It doesn't have to be styrofoam. You could, there's other uh, membranes or uh, ways to, to... So that would be underneath the straw bale? Underneath the straw bale, depending on how it's sitting. So... Um, it also depends where your straw bales are. Because what I want to illustrate here is your straw bale can be in between your framing members. Mm -hmm. But ideally, you want to protect your, the frame of your house too. So that's, so then your straw bales, they're on the outside of your frame. And so what happens is that you're inside the house and you see your post and beam, you see your frame. Wow, that's awesome. So then your foundation is different, whether like your bales on the outside or, or on the inside. In this scenario, they probably are, would be over your wood joists already or your, your, your wood flooring. Uh, 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 as where this one, you adapt the foundation accordingly to support the weight um, of all that straw bale. Um, uh, um, straw bale, depending, there's different sizes of bales too. There's like the two string and the three string, and <laughs> I don't, I don't remember the, exactly the dimensions of it, but the. And the, there's different densities of it too, and different machines will have different size of bales. So, um, I don't know, I'll say like the John Deere bale is 32 by 15, but the whatever, the Toro bale is like 33 by, it's just about like there's like, the, or depending on how they tune their machine too, and the, the level of compaction is gonna be different. So, uh, and ideally what, when, when you're, you want to go the straw bale way to minimize your effort, <laughs> um, you want to know the size of your, the average size of your straw bale ahead of time, and you plan your framing accordingly. Um, so from, from end to end, because if you end up with your bales, you start on this corner and you go boom, 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 and then you have like half a bale here, well, then that means you need to cut it. But then when you need to cut a straw bale, you need to cut, you, you need to remove the strings and it gets all fluffy. So then you need to kind of build a, a some sort of a rack, like to keep, keep your straw bale from collapsing. Then you can cut it and then you need to restring it. You, so you retie your bale and you can put it in your frame. But if you can anticipate all of that work ahead of time, you can adjust, adjust your frame accordingly. Same goes with when you have um, your uh, your doors and windows. And you so then, if you don't like the less the less cutting of a straw bale you have to do, 
the better. Um, it's not super effective to cut a straw bale. Like I, I ultimately, I guess you can you can come up with a lot of creative ways, but uh, a chainsaw is a tool that actually kind of works good for cutting your straw bale, resizing your straw bale. Hopefully you're accurate with your, you know how to handle a chainsaw, <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, they have uh, big uh, straw saws too, it's like, it's a big saw about this long, it's a bit of a radius to it, it looks like those uh, Pioneer Crosscut saws, and it's for cutting straw bales. So that's a tool, like, so if you go to yard sales or like, antique shops, like, look for, look for those and uh, get those on, on hand. Um, and then same goes with the uh, the height of your windows and, and doors. Because if you have your wall and then you have a window here, but <laughs> you end up like having a bale and a half. So then there's going to be a lot of cutting going on in this, this area here. But in generally speaking, in any kind of building, technique other than using rock wool <laughs> and those underneath the windows <coughs> and above the doors they're like the tricky areas they're like tricky detailing finishing and they're they're slow they're uh, or they're slower uh, with a straw bale like you can you can cut your size and you, you you pound it in like in between the two mm -hmm. and if it's too tight you can use a, a sheet of plastic that you would put in underneath first to add like as a to reduce the friction of straw bale to straw bale or uh, what's another like a crazy carpet would do it or uh, like Tyvek a, a sheet of Tyvek you can s sneak in there and you could do the same trick when you get to the top here you gotta smash your last straw bale against your uh, your top plate you can put a bit of you could plastic and Tyvek you pound your straw bale in and you it's quite funny, like the, the big uh, the big mallets that people make for pounding the, the straw bale. It's big, big, big head because you don't want to just ding one quarter. You kind of try to hit more evenly. And then after you're done, it's like magic trick. You pull your, your plastic out of there and your straw bale is there. Afterwards, you have to straighten your wall. So like your bales over time, like they'll, they'll zigzag in and out a little bit. They don't... So you have to decide whether you're make, making your inside your flush side or the outside, or you average it out, depending on how you're gonna finish it. If, uh, if you're gonna put reg regular siding on the outside or cladding, or um, then you would choose your inside face as your like key face. And then you just go and tap your bales and bring them flush and go from inside to outside and whatever like, to, you need to do to uh, have a nice straight wall and then um, in between the straw bales this you know there's going to be a little bit of a gap from just the fact that in their nature the straw bale the way they're tied and fit together and so before you you go on and plaster that you'll need to uh, stuff the, the all the holes and openings you stuff some straw in there you don't want any gaps like um, if you think of it of a more conventional home, you will go and spray foam like the areas. So, but then because you're using straw, then you you stuff some straw in there. Yeah. In, in straw bale, do you have any concerns with like critters, like mice and insects and stuff? So okay, I knew I I was waiting. I knew someone would call <laughs> ask that question eventually. But uh, like, have you ever had mice in in your house yeah. or a regular house? <laughs> have you ever had insects in any house? Right. right. So. The same, the same for straw bale. It's not worse. If you do it well, it's a non-issue. Uh, it's if it is at the end of the day, it's going to be sealed. Like same, uh, like you don't want insects or rodents to have direct access to your straw bale. Once it's covered with clay, oh, okay. they don't know what's behind and they don't chew. They don't chew dirt, so they're not going to get in. Uh, same goes with insects and other critters, yeah. What about, is the mold risk worse in straw bale regular, like con compared to conventional, or? So, uh, it's all about managing moisture. 
So you need to keep your bales dry all the time. It doesn't change, like the, the farmers, they need to keep their bales dry all the time. So they, they're covered. When you get them to your site, you don't leave them on the ground because they're gonna wick moisture from underneath. So it's gonna be a tarp underneath and then you fold all the, all the sides. And uh, same thing, you cover it up. You want, it can't be wet. Uh, you can't let rain hit it. Otherwise, uh, that's that's the that's where people have failed with with straw bale. Is if it gets wet, it can get wet because when you're plastering over it, you're adding tons of moisture on top of your straw bale. But it's also drying without within a week or two, and it's right on the surface. It's if you have like moisture, it can get wet. Like every a lot of things, even wood. If you get wood wet. Over time, it will decay if it stays wet. But I can take a, a two by four and like go dunk it in the lake and then get it out right away and use it. But so it's it's water resistant, but not waterproof per se. Like there's a there's a scientific term is agrophobic potential. So it's like the difference between how I should make the little doodle. It's almost funny, but. Uh, Um, you have a scale with your uh, fulcrum, and then uh, how does that go again? How much? How much water can you get? And that's your your measure, whatever. It is. <laughs> but how much water can you pour into the material before you tip the scale, knowing that there's going to be drying happening? So this would be like your drying uh, ha action. So you can put a little bit at a time and you're not gonna tip the scale, but if it's too much at once, that's never gonna dry fast enough to, pre to prevent uh, rot and, and decay. Um, and that, that would happen probably around doors and windows and all like what's called like the penetrations. Penetrations, you're gonna seal them, seal and flash them really well. To uh, like any other house, really. Yes. Like uh, yeah. when you're doing uh, renovations on a house, when you're pulling the front door, like that's where you see all the. Yeah, like even here, that's where we're leaking in the door over the door. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Support is supported by Leo. Ah, yeah. So, uh, what else about straw bale? Um, I, I had just a quick question about the yeah. frame. So, the window frames and the door frame, or the window frame in particular, is that just sitting on straw bale, or are you like tacking it to the? You can do. Floor? You can do both. Uh -huh. You can do both. Um, I would advise having your frame. So you would have. Uh, 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 yeah. Good. Good. So you would have uh, studs. Uh, like every two foot center, like in a, or no, not two foot center, like every straw bale, you would have a stud, a straw bale, a stud, a straw bale. Running floor to ceiling. Still. Yeah, oh, okay, supporting, okay. supporting your floor to ceiling. And then because the thickness of the bale is 15, 16 inches, you have another stud on the inside and they're connected through a piece of plywood top and bottom. So side view that becomes a, uh, that's a two by four and a two by four. You have your plywood, like a, almost a plywood gusset, top and bottom. Cool. And that's making a, what's called a Larson truss. So this, this become your, your 15 inch thick wall studs without having 15 inch thick uh, pieces of wood. Mm. So you're making a, it's a more efficient use of wood and it's it's quite strong actually. You're doubling. It's a truss, and you're doubling the. Uh, well, they are. You're more than doubling the the, 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 the the width of your wall, really. And then you're stuffing straw in the middle. So you'll yeah, the, you'll stuff a little bit of straw, in between, for sure. Like in between each bale, you make your spacing consistent. Um, uh, 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 um, that's that's uh, code approved in California. Like if you ever want to go like straw bale way in California, and there, there's a, an appendix in their building code, all about straw bale. 
There's a group of uh, architects and engineers. They decided to push straw bale and get into the into the building code over there, and then so now it's it's uh, it's, it's approved. And now that kind of also came to be is there was like California the, 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 a lot of fires in California, and then they would go back and fly like, why is that house still standing? And like everything else around it burned, and they realized that it was a straw bale home. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So it makes sense because it's so dry. Right. Yeah. 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 And like with straw, straw doesn't burn for it'll burn, but it'll um, singe. I guess is that the word? Mm -hmm. So it'll ch just char, but it doesn't really burn for se. And when you have like the level of compaction, there's not that much flow of oxygen in there. And then if you coat it with a nice thick layer of plaster, then uh, it's it's pretty much fireproof and then depending on depending on the uh, the content of your clay mix or your plaster mix I mean um, with heat you know how you bake clay and you're making tiles or you're making something else with like I've heard too that um, with the through the, the heat process it actually hardens the plaster finish which makes it more resistant and waterproof so that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty spookum. Uh, yeah, I like Shadow. Mm. Yeah. Shadow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 what else about straw bale? Oh, the the uh, the uh, the R factor of the straw bale. Like mm -hmm. it'll depend on the it'll depend on the thickness of your bale and the orientation of the bale. Um, and the, the way the strings are too. Like you don't put a bale on its side. It doesn't have like much. In there it's strength for say with more squeeze in one way than in the other from the the way they they, they pack the bales yeah. uh, but if you don't have a load bearing assembly I think you could you could get away with flipping your bales either which way um, if you really want to go like crazy crazy like you could flip it on the on the long side and then you have like 30 inch deep wall uh, wow. but you That's big. Mm -hmm. But you'll need more bales yeah. than if you go like the length of the wall. Um, and then, but then I want, also want to emphasize that, sure, like a straw bale, not, well, nowadays it's about, what, like, let's say $10 a bale, but it's, you can get it for cheaper than that. But then, there's the rest of the house, right? You can't just say, oh, my straw bales are going to cost me like $4,000 and I have a house. No, like you need a foundation, you need your walls, you need a roof, you need your doors, you need your windows. Yeah. It's just that component, you know, it's, it's, it's not so bad, but if you compare it, I'd, I'd be curious, I haven't done that exercise in a while, compare it to like a rock sole or fiberglass insulation. But uh, ultimately the properties of it, uh, which we'll touch upon a bit, a bit later too, like they're, they make it more efficient than uh, the, commercial, the commercial options. But they um, they say like the R value of straw or a straw bell is between R 1.8 and uh, 2.8. I guess I could put that there. Uh, so it's R 1. Straw bell would be R 1.8 to 2.8. And I would I'll put that in the insulation category. What's the more like rock salt, rock wall? Like well, it depends on the thickness of the, the bat, right? You'll get like a, what is it again? So seven inches is, uh, so it's about R4, I think, for a rock saw, give or take. Uh, yeah, I think that's about that. Do they're putting it on the outside now, I see. Yeah, there's a diff they have, it's the same recipe, the same panel, they just changed the density of it, and they're adding it, and that's to... Uh, that's helping with also thermal bridging, which I want to touch on uh, on that aspect later. Uh, 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 I got a question. Um, what about, so for the roof for the straw bale, because I mean, you're only dealing with so much thickness, right? It depends on how you do the roof, I guess. So what's like, 
an efficient way to go about doing a roof. Because if you have like super thick walls or whatever, that's great. But then if you have like a roof that's whatever, six inches or something or eight inches, then you lose all the heat, right? So how do you do the Yeah. What's the best way to, to do the roof for? The best way. Or maybe okay. not the best that's way, the, uh... but what, like what, a, what is like an efficient way, I guess? Like I, I know you can use like those LDLs or whatever. And I know people do that. Yeah. But is there something else maybe that's like not using LDLs? <laughs> um, well, so I'm assuming you don't want a vaulted ceiling, you want a flat ceiling then? Uh, and then your roof is on is in there, like you oh. create an attic space? Or you want it open like like a cathedral ceiling also it's called? I, I don't really have a preference, I'm just, you know, just the thought of insulating the roof came to my mind. Like, yeah. yeah, it's the same as a normal house. It doesn't change whether it's straw bill or something else, the roof is the roof okay. in itself. Yeah. Uh, you can't use straw bill. I don't think you, I guess you could put a lot of mesh, but it'd be kind of awkward to like have a bit of mesh stapled on the bottom of your rafter and stuff it from the top yeah. down and push it down and then you roll your mesh and then you keep it and then finishing, I guess it's a circus act like. <laughs> I, I was just wondering if uh, is is it is it realistic or practical to use wool? Wool as insulation? I, I was I think we've talked about it before. Wool is actually an excellent insulator, right? Yeah. So for your roof, would you yeah, sheep wool. wool would be? Yeah, uh, sheep wool. Uh, if you can have a good source of sheep wool, that's that's the challenge there, and then usually it's expensive or unheard of before, but like there's a guy who has some sheep, but he doesn't do anything with the wool because to send it away to get processed and it costs more him more money, so he just buries it or burns it. I said, what? Um, yeah. Really, you're burning the sheep wool? Like, <laughs> but, like, you know, it's like people burning their fields like to get more crops, like kind of thing. I'm like, well, let's do, I don't know, I don't get that, that logic. It's a whole uh, part of a decaying, wasteful culture. Yeah. I think yeah, there but you know, instead of like, yeah, anyway, different topic, for, I guess, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd have to felt the wool almost to make it really thick and soak it. I do have like some wool on the table outside there, which I reclaimed from the house that I renovated when I renovated. There was a uh, sections of walls that were stuffed with sheep wool. Wow. Amongst with old clothes and socks and uh, yeah. whatever. Like how old? <laughs> and Duke of Warren, who's yeah. It was built in yeah, 19, too, I pulled up my old 1943 or 48. Right, so they used that right. as insulation yes. back then. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe, Very cool. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, maybe the Japanese they... homes in the orchard, so, it was newspaper. When I was doing a yeah. rental and I was working on it, and I was reading uh, articles on the media. <laughs> yeah, the challenge, <laughs> the challenge yeah. with the wool <laughs> is uh, if, if you don't have a, a, a cheap, local available source it's expensive because yeah. it is a product that you can buy it's super mega expensive to get the sheep wool and then you'll need so much of it that it becomes cost prohibitive mm -hmm. to actually use it but if you can have it locally that's that's super <coughs> cool that's like is it uh it wicks moisture and um when it, when it gets wet it'll dry over like it'd be similar to like cellulose blowing in cellulose after the fact just for yeah, yeah, you could For do your roof with blown in cellulose too, yeah, yeah. Or depending on your roof pitches and how your access, but... Uh, yeah. An aircrete maybe, or is that just like too crazy? I don't know enough about aircrete to see, to know how it would work out with that. Um, I think with aircrete you still have to build a, a conventional wall. You would have, well, you need your frame, yeah. you need to support the aircrete from underneath somehow, yeah. unless you're making panels and you can then... I don't know why that would work. Uh, yeah, no, it has to be supported somehow. I, I guess I don't really know how heavy it is as well. I'm just picturing like concrete being heavy, but if it's like mostly air, it's probably not, right? Yeah, it's mostly it's air. It's lighter, like a 94 pound bag will do quite a bit. 45 gallons is what it would do. Yeah, so. yeah well, I think he's building you look at that volume that's spread out over quite a bit. Yeah, so some not so beefy strapping might keep it up there. Yeah, yeah even yeah. drywall is like yeah. pretty freaking heavy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Even Jay, my friend Jaden, he's building an crete and he's just doing a flat roof, and the, everyone that's telling him he has to build a conventional roof over it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, because yeah. it's it, snow and everything. Yeah, oh, the, the air crete can't like even no pitch. You mean. Yeah. You need a pitch. Oh, <laughs> you need a pitch. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it won't hold it. The air crete won't yeah. hold the snow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The snow load. We used uh, cotton 
insulation. Uh, like treated with or borax. Shredded yeah, it was where shredded did you, jeans. Where did you get that? Stuff? SBS. They had just a well, bunch of shredded had, jeans. They had, oh, to, they had, they had to bring it, it in. There's a manufacturer uh, down yeah. in the southern, southeastern states, I think, that makes the insulation and it's shredded jeans. It's yeah. literally indigo blue. And yeah, then so it's cool. treated with borax for, okay. for insects. But it was a super easy. Insects and it's yeah. also fire resistance, the borax, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't it worked quite well. Well. unpleasant to work with. It wasn't that bad. And it's not itchy. And and it what, no, or what was the R factor? I guess how it depends it's, on how much you put in. It was actually really good. Yeah. Uh, I think that <laughs> yeah. Levi's are the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, you know, fluffy. It was heavier than, than rock solar or, or fiberglass for it, the thickness yeah. of it, you know, weight-wise. I found floppy. like... It, you know, where with the fiberglass you can stick it between the the joists and it'll actually hold them. Mm -hmm. this but wouldn't. this would flop out because mm -hmm. it's Strap. kind of yeah. cotton floppiness. Yeah, it doesn't have the same fluffiness as the. Uh, yeah, but uh, it still uh, did the trick. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, people that live in, in vans too, like I did that in my van, uh, whatever, my van, but the, the, the recycled uh, jeans. Instead of using anything else, I, I use that in there because I, I was like, I'm going to sleep in here. I don't want to read that. Well, here, even here on the walls, we actually recycled wool blankets from like we went and we collected it and we sewed it. So a couple of the walls have wool blankets. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. I'll touch on Cobb, but Cobb uh, is, in a way, it's the same recipe. You can cut if if you're using it like play-doh, you'll call it cob. But if you're making bricks and shapes, and then it it gets called uh, adobe. But if you're using it to plaster your walls, then it's a then it's a plasterer. But in essence, cob is sand, clay, and straw. And uh, you can you can adapt the ratios a little bit, but that's that's what cob is. Uh, oh, you mix it with water. That's that the water is the magic. Is what the secret sauce there. Um, so that you can actually work it into something else. Um, and also, you'll see you probably eventually pick up a lot of the natural building or plaster. Uh, I mean, um, and cob recipes that give you ratios for the for the uh, different components, but water, it's kind of left out because it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the humidity that day. It depends how well you store your materials so they have some inherent moisture in them. Mm -hmm. And it depends what kind of consistency you want to have to work with. So if you're, if you're building up a wall, you, it can be a bit, you want it more, uh, well, sticky, uh, what's the word here? Mm -hmm. Like you put, you might get, you'll be able to get away with less water, but then when you're higher up or you need to spread it more, then you'll add a bit more water, or if you're around the window and it's a tricky corner, then you might want to get it a bit more wet to work it. So water, water is usually left out of the recipes uh, for that reason. It depends on your, your use or purpose of that at that time. Um, is it similar to concrete where the more water you add to the mix, the the less, I guess, well, it weakens it. Like you add more water uh, to your mix and, and uh, so, yeah, you bring um, down MPA. Or, or yeah, <laughs> um, there's a bit of a potential to that too, but it wouldn't be like, it won't get weaker. You might, and it'll depend on your clay body, so you get a bit more shrinkage. Also, it's like like drywall mud yeah. is a, the, the easy example. If you buy the wet mud, you, the, the more wet mixes, when they dry, like it doesn't even look like I put anything on that wall because it was mostly, uh, there was a lot of water content. So uh, there's a bit of that too, but you also want it to be malleable and you want to be able to do something with it. So. You'll you'll tweak the water even today. Like we'll we'll play with that a little bit. Like add a bit more water, less water, um, 
it, it's all, it all depends. Uh, the cob, you can make walls with it. Oh, uh, earthen floor, it's a cob recipe. Right. It's the same, right? It's just like uh, how you finish it is different. Um, so cob, cob is pretty universal in that sense, uh, worldwide, and uh, it could be easily available. It's an option, like there's straw is a byproduct of the the, the, the wheat industry, so there's like lots of straws. I don't foresee that disappearing, and there's clay and sand everywhere. <laughs> so I don't. That's definitely uh, something you can do. You can sculpt it, um, make all sorts of shapes, or like the uh, you know the cob benches that mm. for sure you've seen. Uh, so it does have uh, some structural properties to it from the the density of it. Um, uh, uh, um, it doesn't have much insulation property because there's not a high enough straw content to it. So it's mostly clay and sand. So um, I have a little, uh, I'll, I'll have to show it after. I'll have a little graphic, a little doodle on a scale. Like the more fiber or straw you have, the more insulating you have, the more sand and aggregate you, and clay, it's more like thermal mass. So it's less insulative is what it means. And cob falls into that from its nature. It's less insulative than straw bale uh, and even wood. So like depending, depending on your density, your mix and all of that, a cob is rated more like an R0.3 to uh, 0 0.9. And, so. and um, how, how are, like, say for the earthen floor, how is it, like, sealed, if that's the right word, you know, like, how... So yeah, that, so, uh, it's so it's it's an oil, you oil it's and oil. and you can put wax in it. Right, and what kind of oil, is it like a linseed or something? Yeah, uh, I want to come back to that oh, okay. later, yeah, I want to cover the earthen floors for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else about cob? Uh, there's a long drying time. With cob, because there's a lot of actually a lot of water going into that that mix, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's be but it's because of the thickness of the walls or what the thickness of the depth of whatever you're building. That's a lot of moisture, and it's gonna migrate from the center of the bench of the wall and get its way out. So the surface of your wall is always gonna is gonna look wet for a long time before the inside is dry. Um, uh, uh, uh. Oh, also it cannot freeze while it's wet. Mm -hmm. So as you're building it, and that's one thing too, uh, natural material or everything, <laughs> a lot of natural material like, as you're building it because of the use of water, it can't, it can't freeze, it can't get wet. So it becomes a very seasonal endeavor in that in the winter you absolutely can't do it outside. Uh, and then it needs to dry. So it, during the fall, you can mix it, you can do it, but you're, you're extending your drying time like that much more because the, 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 the air is saturated with moisture already and then it, there's nowhere for the moisture to get out of your wall. Mm -hmm. So you'll need fans and you need heat and you need this and that and that, so uh, drying time. And because it doesn't have like much insulation property, I'll put that in the structural. So uh, that's that's worldwide. People build a disruption. Uh, you know, it's it's solid. Like I was saying, you can make the floor with it. So you can step on it. You won't damage it. Uh, there's other other stuff to it. Um, what's another material here? Cordwood we touched on. Uh, rammed earth. Anybody? knows about what ram dirt is or a little bit ram dirt was well, compressed earth or whatever compressed earth yeah i was almost i had this idea with popcorn but i don't know i just thought of it popcorn <laughs> yeah popcorn, popcorn is a mix. i don't know it's a mix, mix. yeah <laughs> so ram dirt is um you're mixing sand maybe a bit of a clay or a bind, some sort of binder, sometimes uh, five to 10% of cement, Portland cement in it. And you're building up a, a form like you would a concrete 
house. So it's similar in the, uh, in many aspects of making something out of concrete, but instead of being a pour where you have a slurry that you're dumping in your forms, it's a, it's more of a dry dry mix. There's a bit of water still in to 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 for the concrete or clay react uh, cement or concrete reaction to uh, start. Um, but you dump it like about six inches at a time into your form and then you need to get in your form and tamp it and compact it and then compact and do the whole the whole perimeter of your house and then you come in you dump more material in there and you pack it in and so until you build up your entire your entire wall system um, it's very demanding and you need machinery because it's a lot of material to move and then as you build up the height of your wall you need to dump like you know six inches of sand into your forms or you need like machinery for that uh, and then the tamping it's a lot of tamping if you want like a good consistency and density uh, but they have the um, uh, 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 air tampers so you need like a giant air compressor running your hose and you need to be in the form like you and then you're like and you get a temp everywhere along the way. So it's very, very time consuming too. Um, when you see in the form, like yeah, how so, wide is it? Well, it depends on how, how wide you want to have your walls, right? So but it has you, to be wide enough that a person can actually Ideally, ideally you would want that. Otherwise it'd be super awkward. <laughs> okay. Or you would have to have like a temper extension of sorts to be able to get in there. Um, mm -hmm. But what you can do is, uh, can you hire children to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Leo's kids are. <laughs> but what you can do is like you don't build your entire wall at once. You'll build like your two foot, your, whatever your forms are, like two foot. And then uh, you, dump, you fill that up and then you, you build up your your strong backs and all your framing for your, for your forms uh, as you build it up too. So uh, there's that. It must be hard to do window though indoors. Well, underneath your windows, that's going to be planned. I'm not sure how you, how you detail underneath the window to get that uh, done right. Um, would you, would you put in like a conventional, just like wood frame for windows in it, like insert that? And, and all, they also have con they also have concrete inserts for for mm -hmm. these houses too, like right. in lentils for, uh, yeah. for uh, yeah, or window sills. They have concrete window sills too that you can pop in there, and then uh, I think they, they kind of camouflage some of the imperfections of uh, the, the the process. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, there's a there's a rounded house in the cusp that uh, Mike. Yeah. Mike and Dave Madden they built that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Probably four or five years ago, they built a rounded home in the cusp. Um, yeah, big big timber frame home and. The thing too is like you need a solid foundation because it's a, like many many tons of weight that you're sitting in like that one strip for for your for your form, um, and then the insulation of it it doesn't have inherent insulation for say because it's sand and you're packing it really hard so there's no air pockets in the in there. Um, there is a way that you avoid the thermal bridging uh, by adding a strip of uh, rock, rock wall insulation in the middle of your wall. So you kind of end up having like, picture it like having two, two walls side by side in the same form that are separated by a layer of insulation too. Uh, but ram dirt, I don't have a, really a R value on that, but I'd be structural. Uh, hempcrete, hempcrete. So as uh, I've said many times, maybe not everybody has heard me say it yet. I've retrofitted my house with hempcrete, with joy. Um, so hempcrete is the stock of the hemp plant that has been uh, mechanically defibered and uh, chopped. And uh, I have some on the, uh, some of the raw material uh, on the table outside there. And so what 
you, you add the properties of the hemp stock, there's like little air, air pockets in there, a bit like the straw. Uh, and I'm told also um, the sun, sunflower has also this a similar property and you don't certainly don't need a permit or a license to grow sunflowers. <laughs> but hemp, I think it's pretty regulated yeah, for, some, hard. for some weird reason. But, um, uh, 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 so you mix it with some lime and it's, it acts as a binder and then um, has uh, it cures I forget some of the, uh, I think yeah it, the lime cures and then it sets it sets pretty hard again depending on the level of compaction so you can go from having a really really like fluffy wall to even using it like they talk about using it as a foundation beam a bit like so uh, but it would be more density but then you lose in your insulative property uh, so they, they talk about 0 point, um, 0 0.9 to 2.5 so um, for instances like in our scenario um, in some of the room, we and we we worked out the glitches in the in the walls that we were gonna cover up with um, that we were gonna, gonna do some tiling work over. Uh, I was gonna use a magnesium oxide panel to cover it up. So even if it's not pretty looking, it's it's like uneven. It's gonna get covered up anyway. And I have, as a result of me not temping it because we had some volunteers helping a bit, then it's not temped as hard, and hence so I have more insulation value than if. You let me loose and I want to have a perfectly straight wall and it's like packing it till I get the finish and then it's less insulated. <laughs> uh, the beauty of the hempcrete that, uh, yeah, well the beauty, one of the benefits of using the hempcrete uh, and packing it like that is that you end up with a perfect uh, finish for plastering over it. So it's already like there's, it's uneven but it's kind of straight. It's in, in its own, the, the little air pockets and holes in there, so the plaster grips to it right away. You don't need to prepare the surface in any way. You can plaster right over it. You, you'd have to like just um, cover up your wood members, your studs, so make sure that uh, the plaster holds on to that. But the hempcrete, uh, some people, you do full houses out of hempcrete. Um, I don't think they support the roof uh, from the hempcrete and I would definitely, I'm uncertain, I would advise against it out of precaution and for the durability of the structure. Um, also with the hempcrete, and that, that I knew about it, but that happened to us. Uh, we, we ran out of hempcrete. We didn't finish the house and we ran out. But it's, it's also kind of labor intensive, all that packing. Uh, but we were able to go and dig out the hempcrete out of the, some walls that were not finished, like the first four feet weren't finished. So we dug it up and we were able to remix it. So before we actually really ran out, we reused about 50% of old hempcrete wow. with new hempcrete. And then we stuff it in the wall again. And then if, that, if I have to do that again, I can, if I, or if I want to make a window, I decide I want to have a window here. I can chip out the hempcrete, save it, and then if I need to mix a new batch of hempcrete, then I have like I have that material already. So it's kind of neat in that way that we can we can reuse it. Um, it's more uh, more sustainable. It's fireproof. I've not done the test, but if you have a tiger torch, I'm willing to put our test block and we can put a torch on it. Um, but we have a little torch like this. No, tiger torch is there. Oh well, the part, the, the part of the, pack, the, the the building process with the hempcrete is where you would have your frame. Ideally, you'd have your frame up, and then you put a, a a slip form, like a piece of plywood, at the bottom of your wall. You you mix you mix your your hempcrete, and then you put it in about four inches at a time, okay. and you you move it kind of uniformly in your form, and then that's where you start packing it. Uh, I'm probably overpacking it out of precaution, but and so yeah, it doesn't need to be a fancy temper or two by four or like a 
one uh, one by one. Anything that you can reach in there and tamp can be creative. Uh, you want to make, especially the, the corners and the flat face, where if you're going to plaster, you want to make that nice and, and, and tight and compact. So you would want a flat one to go against it? You can do that. Mm -hmm. And then you put in another 4 inch lift. Move, uh, move, even it out, pack it 4 inches at a time, and you work up, up your wall. Same as other processes, under the windows, it's a bit tricky to finish and at the top of the walls, uh, finishing, because then you can't pour it from the top, you're at the top of the wall. So you end up, uh, I, there's many ways you can just do it from the face, from the front, and finish out that way. I like to have more of a triangle form. Um, yeah, I have the whiteboard, I might as well, I might as well use it. Is there a way of just combining these different tubes? Like, I'm putting a straw and then putting hempcrete on the straw or something like that? Like straw bale? Or you, mm. you know? oh, they won't bind. I'm not sure. I'm just there, I don't think they would bind, and then because they're dissimilar materials, there's, there's no chemical bond between the right, two, okay. but depending on how you build your wall, like, and, and because the straw is kind of soft, I think if you were to touch your wall, the handcrete would probably crack or yeah. fall off or chip. That's what I thought because I did see that someone did the do a straw bale house and then they put handcrete plaster and it cracked oh. within a couple mm. of years. Different expansion rates. Yeah, so it doesn't really work that well, I guess. So let's say you have your wall and I have uh, I have handcrete all the way up to here. This is all full, this is all done. And it doesn't fluff back in, like you, you use the same form as you go up the wall. As soon as you're done, you can remove your plywood, move it up, Upward. and you reuse it. Um, it's, uh, it, I mean, ultimately I found out too, I was packing a little too hard sometimes, and like it, it would fluff back down at the bottom a little bit. I kind of over, overdid it. Uh, and you make sure that your form overlaps the top of your last concrete lift to avoid bulging, actually. Uh, but I guess it was bulging like lower down the wall before I, I noticed what was happening. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you have your form, put it in, move your form up, move your form up, move your form up. At the end, finish the wall. I like to have a... Nope, sorry, the other way. More of a little triangle uh, form. And then I'll move it on the other side. So I pack from the side here. So I'm able to fill that up all the way up to here. All the triangle, yeah. I'm filling that up, I'm filling that up. And I can move it a little bit in and I end up filling in, filling here. So what I'm left with at the end is like I just do the front, like I face tamp it. Mm -hmm. And just that little like... Just the center. Well, actually like just here because I can also... <laughs> Pack it, push it down a little bit, so like that's the that's the like the, the thing. But also, the higher you go, the more time-consuming it becomes, because as you bring in your lifts up, the first four feet they're super easy because you come in with your bin of handcrete, lean it against the form, push it in, and then tap it. But then once you start to having to walk on a step, and then you, and then you. You can dump it in, and then when you, eventually you're you're so high that you can't scoop it in, and so then it, it's like handfuls at a time to kind of put it in because like there's no more headroom. And um, there would be ways with the Larson truss, similar to uh, what I was oh, yeah. mentioning earlier with the straw bale, where you uh, depending on how the how you build your house, like the the order. If you don't do your second floor or your roof right away, technically you still have access from the top in between your walls. Mm. So you could stuff it and make it really perfect that way. But with natural materials, you want to keep them dry. So ideally you put up a foundation, you put some walls, put a roof, and then you come back and you do your insulation yeah, that makes sense. Uh, to avoid, avoid uh, further problems. When uh -huh. we did the Larson truss, we used two by twos on the inside stud and two by fours on the outside, just yeah, to yeah, yeah. reduce the amount of wood a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what you can do too is uh, you just buy a bunch of two by six, and you rip them. 
Yeah. So you have like a like two and a half on the outside and <coughs> two on the inside, or two like one and seven eighths minus the curve cut, whatever. But so then yeah, so that's a good that's a very good efficient uh, use of wood, and uh, it does involve like more more manipulation of the wood because you got to rip it. But yeah, I think you would you'd save on on cost for the the volume of wood. Yeah. What is the hemp crate? Hempcrete, well it's uh, lime and the hemp. No, no, there's no concrete? No. Oh, that's weird that they call it hempcrete. Yeah, uh, well in Europe they call it, what's the word in Europe they call it? Lime, so hemp, hemp, hemp lime. And one. Hemp lime. Okay. Hemp. Or, uh, so you use lime like the... But you could use no. concrete. To, no, you can use uh, cement no, actually, not like concrete. Yeah. You can use cement if you want. The one lady that we talked to that has uh, done a, a full hempcrete house, she's done some tests too, and she saw no additional benefit of adding cement to her mix. She, she advises against it. And then from the properties of uh, cement too, which is less, water doesn't move through it at the same rate or the same way as uh, other materials. So then she said, don't, don't put it. That's the beauty of uh, those natural materials is uh, they they let water travel through uh, insulation. Lime is water hungry too, so it actually draws the moisture out of the fiber, oh, right? Okay. It's hydrophilic or whatever. Okay, it looks like a flower. Yeah, there's a lot of wine deposits out towards Hills, Roseberry. There's some up the old slide trail. You can see it. The whole thing is on the slide. Lots of them. 0.9. Yeah, there's a lot of Probably used for building. Cellulose, 3.6 to. Or, um, so you're not moistening the lime that you're mixing with the hemp fiber. You're just putting lime powder in. No, no, we, you, you do add water to the mix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's hemp, the hemp, the lime, and the water. That's what initiates the lime yeah, reaction to to, right. uh, to set up. Yeah. What's the word for it? Yeah. Other other insulation that I have like some values for a sheep wool, 3.2, 3.9, really high in con contrast to even straw bale or hempcrete. Cellulose also very high. Cellulose is shredded newspapers. Uh, it's been uh, treated. Shredded newspaper. Yeah. yeah. They usually okay. put it on the roofs. With borax, so usually in in roofs like or attics. Uh, in walls too, uh, you can blow blow it in. Uh, but in, in uh, you can use it in an attic, but not in a in a sloped roof uh, because it will slough and settle a little bit over time, and not a lot. So then uh, the building inspectors they don't let you use that because then that that means in ten years we don't have any insulation at the roof because it. it it slides it, and it depends on the pitch of your roof. There's a certain, a certain variable. Like at some point, it's not. Uh, you have to have a bat insulation. They say for uh, so that it's, you get insulation all the time in there. Uh huh. Um. Uh, how do you guys feel? Maybe we take a quick, like little, like water break, and then we'll jump back into like some more like uh, geeky science uh, stuff in here. And then after that, we can uh, have lunch, I think. A little short. Okay. It's 11.50 right now. Mm. And you know how like, you put like the water mixing thing? And like if it sounds on the bottom, then it's like yeah. on the top. There's no like front tile to put on the front On the way up, there's like this one. Beautiful. Yeah, well, let's, let, I'd still like, we could check with, with Crystal, but I think it, it makes sense. I'd like to cover up some of that science before we move on to the other stuff so that it makes sense to, uh, once we look at stuff, we can have a grasp of like, we can compare the different properties and materials. So, so maybe just take a five minute break. Yeah, a little, a little stretch, a little water, and then we'll come back and, yeah.
Thanks. Yeah, it sounds cool. I know, it sounds yeah. super cool. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually a... Apparently it works really well with the earthen floor because it's it gives it a nice thermal mass. So once you heat that up, it's See? just yeah, it's just radiating yeah, heat radiates. out of it. And then you don't have to heat it as much. And then there's no air hot air blowing in your house or loud. I had it my old house we had on. Marlon, I'll, I'll start back. You're welcome to keep reading if you want, but I'll uh, I'm gonna listen to you. I'm I'm like the, okay. Oh. Building side, so I, I, I'll probably look at my notes a little bit, make sure that I don't miss out on any important aspects. Yeah, that was fun. Because this is what makes any building or structure comfortable uh, and last a long time. And uh, uh, without any negative effects on human health, too. So that we're also talking about air quality uh, with that. So there's the four the four layers that any structure should have or any good structure should have. <laughs> so there's the, the the water control layer, the thermal control layer, the vapor control layer, and the air control layer. And so I this is like a cutout of a of a building, and you have to be able to draw or you know it doesn't to draw the layer around your building for to be continuously. Part of the idea is to separate your building from the environment. And once you do that, you control exactly what's happening in here. You're in charge of it. Like if there's like forest fires or whatever pollution, it doesn't get in. If there's like, if it's raining, it doesn't get in. If there's like, so you're really building a shell even anyway, seems funny to say because we want to be more connected with nature, but the, the purpose of like to to have the, the control in there and then uh, like a snail, how it has a little shell that it can protect itself in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like an armadillo but the the snail, like, like if it if it's raining, the snail gets wet. Right. And if it's cold, the snail is cold. So the water control layer <clears throat> Without drawing all the elements, but you have like your roof shingles or your uh, your roof underlay, uh, like your, your you have a membrane going under your shingles first, and then you have some flashing, and then every time you have a, a penetration, like a, a door or a, or a window, there's a big hole in your assembly in your envelope. That's a big hole, but then you need to keep shedding water away so you have some flashings to do that you use some caulking the way you bend your flashings water gets away and underneath here you have another flashing so that water doesn't get behind the rest of your siding all the way down to your foundation you want to divert water away from your foundation and you have some drainage and you take you take you, you need to control the water so it doesn't get into your house and ideally, you want to prevent it from getting under your house as well. Um, when you get, talk about like a... Because then your house will sink? Well, there's potentially that, and then there's frost heaving. If it freezes, if it gets... Depending on your foundation and how deep you go. Uh, stick to the floor? If there's any frost underneath your house ever happening, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lift the house. Like ice has that potential that it's going gonna, it's gonna to lift even a, a fully built house. So uh, it can tilt it? It'll, it'll lift and then when the ice melts, it'll go back down. And so like your crack, your, your, your walls are cracking or your drywall is cracking. Your, you, can, you, can, you can rip your membranes apart and it's creating another hole somewhere else that you don't see because it's hidden away. And you can't walk because... So the idea is like, anyway, the idea is to shut the water away from your, from the outside. So like put it on the concrete. Then you have the thermal layer which is your, your, uh, your insulation. So uh, you want to insulate your roof so that you keep the heat in. Uh, you want to have your walls so you're comfortable. You also want to have consider insulating underneath. There's different ways to do that. Uh, the popular option is uh, rigid foam, rigid styrofoam, which is uh, used heavily. Um, there's uh, you can also use the uh, perlite 
the little white stone volcanic mm -hmm. rock that's been heated up and it's a uh, little porous uh, so that's also uh, an alternative to using styrofoam is perlite and I know like uh, you could get it at Nelson Farmer Supply in uh, big bags anyway I forget the and it's when I did the comparison between uh, the cost cost comparison between the rigid foam and the perlite it was comp it was the same what happens is your rigid foam is only going to be like two inches thick or whatever or four inches depending on the the, the product you get the perlite um, you would leave it in the bag ideally you just like take the bags and put them underneath your your structure your floor uh, even your footings depending uh, and then uh, and you just pack it you leave it in the bag and but you compact it still because you always want to have a compact solid firm foundation for any any structure um, can you mix the perlite into the earthen floors I suppose you could try it, uh, but ideally, I guess I think you would want to keep it underneath. What I, in the book, what Suki did as like when she's prepping the floors, all right, let's say you don't have a concrete slab, she will put the perlite underneath and then uh, pour on top of that. Perlite it, doesn't pack very well. It doesn't, but it's it's enough that because that's why you keep it in the bags too. Okay. So there's like a like like your sandbags, right? Like yeah. if if you got just a pile of sand, you'll just squish it flat. But if it's in the bag, it'll take the shape of the it'll sit take the shape of the bag. Okay. Could you add sand to that? Like make a mixture of sand, perlite, and then possibly that would be a slightly more compactable. That's an idea. That. Yeah, you put. I would think you would lose a bit in your R value, but probably ne negligible, I suppose. Yeah, because you'd still have all that. Like, it, the sand would just fill the gaps in the matrix of uh, yeah. the perlite, yeah, possibly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the perlite, like it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's, the air bubbles are in the, the in stone the material, itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, do you mean perlite, like the little things you put, so, like, people need to put them, like, their car, like, in the Yeah, the little white. A little white yeah. rock, yeah. I would say, yeah. Yeah, and it's the same thing, but because there's little air bubbles in there, little air pockets, that's uh, that's an insulator, or that can act as an insulator. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I guess like the point, of, and there's in the building code now they say okay, like you gotta have R10 for your slab or your foundation, R20 for your walls and R40 for your roof. Or, um, so you double each time, you know, so like 10, 20, 40. That's for now, eventually they want to go, and some people they get like R60 roofs and uh, R40 walls and um, it depends on the thickness of your wall. If, I think like a straw bell wall, you get about R30, 30 by the time you're done I think just about it's like on paper it's not equivalent to that like the engineering about like the natural materials is not uh, representative or reflective of like real life values uh, and it's also that the testing of the insulation products is done in a lab environment so it's a very controlled and static environment with a steady temperature and steady moisture and no wind. So it's totally uh, not yeah. what we get in real life. Right, because uh, let's say uh, fiberglass insulation, when it's wet, zero insulation value. But like the hempcrete, if there's moisture or the hemp or the, the, the cheap wool, if it's wet, it's you're still warm. Still warm yeah. But the fiberglass, no. Um, that would be it. Um, also for, for the th thermal layer, I mean you have a big hole here so ideally you want to offset that by having good quality windows. Um, because that's, that's the weakness in your, in your, in your envelope is going to be your doors and windows. It's, um, uh, 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 uh. And then, well, that's the trade-off, right? You want you want some some light. You want to feel like you're outside, but really, and then uh, the way that heat 
gets uh, or travels or gets transferred. There's three ways of the heat. Uh, there's conduction, so it's by direct contact with something else. So uh, um, the energy it goes from hot to cold, and so whatever is warm is gonna transfer the heat to the cold. So like if you're uh, cooking something, like whatever your stove top. It's going to heat up your pot over time. Uh, the other way is convection. So it's uh, more like, I guess the image is funny, but like it's more like a fluid. Like the hot air rises and cold air goes down. And if there's space, then there's a convection effect going on. Like whatever's at the top goes at the bottom, whatever. And then it moves what's at the bottom and there's a... That, that circulation that's happening in convection. And then um, the other method of heat transfer is radiation. Uh, so the sun is radiating heat everywhere. So your windows is letting in a lot of heat gain when, the, when it's sunny. Yeah. At night, the moment there's no heat gain, you're losing the heat. It's, it's a direct, like it's, it's, it's nice when the sun is shining in as soon as it's shining in, so like one strategy is like you can put like blinds or blankets uh, in front of your windows to prevent the heat from escaping outside. It's like putting a blanket on your on your windows if you want to call it that. So keep 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 retaining some of the heat. Uh, but the the conduction aspect leads to what's called thermal bridging. So. Uh, uh, um, the elements from outside, uh, let's say, uh, okay, good example is your roof. Like your rafters are touching in the winter, they're touching your roof, and there's snow falling on it. So then the snow is going to end up like cooling down your rafters over time. And if your rafters are touching, or your walls, right, if it's touching to your drywall, then your drywall feels cold because the heat or the cold, like the heat escapes through your rafter. But if I can prevent heat from escaping out, so if I, there's a way that I can have my drywall or my wall not touch the rafter, or the rafter not touch what's above, then that's called, uh, 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 well, that's the thermal bridging. It's like I'm preventing the heat from being conducted out of my house and the cold from being conducted inside my home. Uh, that's where, like, uh, what I was talking about earlier, the Larson truss, where you have like two two studs that composing your, your your wall assembly. That's great for thermal bridging because from one stud to the next, there's all that insulation in between. So then, it doesn't travel in or out. Uh, and then there's fields of science and builders they get super geeky about it now and then they get like I can't have screws go through my you know like they put the screws from the side for the siding this way and then the next layer it can't go through it's gonna be like separate because then I'm losing heat through my screws and it was like true true it's not it's it's the physics of it for sure but I am not I'm not at that stage where I'm gonna Try to put less screws to prevent the thermal bridging. <laughs> yeah. So it's called bridging when you're curing the problem. Yeah. And then what is the problem conductivity. called? Conductivity. Yeah. Conductivity. conductivity. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then one other question, because I'm trying to do this for the people who'd be watching it online. You talked about the walls needing to be R30. Correct. R20. Or, well, or whatever. Minimum R20, uh, depending on. Right. Or, yeah, yeah. So then if we go back to your list over there, straw bale yeah. being 1.8 to 2.8 yeah. R value, how does per that inch. equate per inch? Okay. Yes, per inch. So if you have right. a 16 inch straw bale times 2.8, that's because that's like about like R30. Uh, right. right. Okay. Yeah. But then you could have factor in like your plaster inside and whatever else is mm -hmm. adding to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just wondering if anyone's getting hungry. Uh, yeah, we should. I just wanted to give you guys a, a heads up. Like, uh, 
Lunch will be ready whenever. Yeah, we just took like a short five minute break and oh, I okay. wanted to touch on the science aspect of it before we stop for, for, for our break, but yeah, we... Okay, well thanks. it'll be ready whenever you... Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, hi. Okay, um... So, so what's, the best, what's the best thing for Virginia's air? It's air, it's, your ins it's having insulation. Yeah. Or, like, and insulation, it's it's air. Right. It's an air gap. Like the, that's why straw. There's air pockets through it, so it's insulated. Like Wool. There's aerospace. Um, the fiber, I think, is very like microscopically like spaced out. Okay, like so it's that's where like I, I'm reading your mind. Like the air creep, it's like because there's air bubbles air. in it. But then if it, if it's just your wall assembly, it's touching in and out. So I don't know what that would. But that would relate. I guess you would have to test the different density and air mm -hmm. bubble sizes. Um, it's amazing how to get thing to, bridge in, to get something out. Yeah. Thing. But so um, so you want to have some form of thermal bridging. Uh, it's it's the older houses they don't have that. Yeah. Um, it's just like it's a stud and it's your side your your siding and that's it. That's why they're not they're cold in the winter for the most part. Yeah. And also, uh, they don't have insulation in their walls. A lot of the older homes, they're just empty stud bays. Uh, certainly, you know, our house in, my house in the cusp and in Salo, it was like that. It's just no insulation in there. Uh, so the insulation, it, it retains the heat that you have inside, that you're creating. And it's also not transferring the heat or the cold that is outside the building. So that's why you have a nice big thick layer. And here in, uh, in this part of North America, we call, we're in the heating climate, it's called. Because we have to put heat in our buildings most of the year. Like right now, we're, we're not. But if you factor in like the span throughout the year, we're in a, we put in more heat than air conditioning. If you go in Texas, it's the other way around. <laughs> they have way more air conditioning than, than heat throughout their, uh, their, their season, their year. That's why the insulation is very important. And that's why I wanted to make a distinction between some of these things where like cob is super awesome material to work with, but it doesn't really have the insulation properties that are really needed for a comfortable or you can still use it but then be prepared to use more heat than if you had a strawberry home per se uh, but then again well it depends um, it depends uh, um, then you would have the vapor control layer and it's, it's going all the way around right like this so uh, you can't just think of things to be just like just the one floor you got to think under your floor and under your slab um, uh, uh, and so vapor why is it important to control vapor well because vapor uh, is always going to be an element of moisture regardless there's always a bit of humidity in the air doesn't matter the time of the year right more more there's in certain periods of the year and so what the, 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 the modern science now is saying, because uh, the, uh, the main source of water vapor here in our country, well, most of the year, again, it fluctuates, it's gonna be from inside the house. You're cooking, you're having a shower, having a bath, you're breathing, you're, you're creating water vapor in here. But then if the water vapor gets into your wall, like in your fiber, if it gets into your fiberglass insulation, your fiberglass insulation is damp and has no more insulation properties. So that's why in the 60s or 70s, they decided to put poly in all the houses. So now it became like you gotta put poly in all your houses to prevent water vapor from getting in. In Texas, it's the opposite. In Texas, because it's a cooling climate, the, the, the vapor layer, the, the poly, is on the outside of the home to prevent the vapor from coming in the building. But anyway, so back to here. 
So what happened is like there was uh, they were stopping the vapor the in, the in the wrong place and then there's condensation because like, if you don't have insulation or good insulation then it gets cold in that wall cavity and all the vapor the water vapor is along the, your walls here like along your so then it condenses and turns to water your, your walls feel damp or your slab feels damp your floor feels damp and it, it condenses Pardon? And they couldn't the walls. Rot the walls. Yeah, so that's why like, uh, the it prevent. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's a decay of uh, you lose of performance of your house. Like you don't feel comfortable because it's damp. And then um, yeah, there's the, there's a decay process that is initiated, and if over uh, over uh, many years, uh, it could cause problems or even. Uh, if you have like some rust, some uh, iron pipes in your walls or whatever, they'll rust because there's water vapor. The pipe is cold. The water condenses on your pipes, and then your stuff rusts. Your nails will rust, and then it stains your wood. And if it can stain your drywall if it gets really, really bad. So, so there's the vapor control layer. But me, I'm more. And I want to introduce you to the vapor open concept. So don't try to trap, don't don't even deal with vapor. I mean, you you kind of, you kind of you need to think about it in these terms because for sure there's going to be vapor. It's going to, but if it's in the building, it's going to get it's going to get out of the building, and if it's out of the building, it's going to get in the building. Like it becomes it becomes a bit of that two. Uh, Two-way system, it'll go, if it gets in the building, it's going to be able to dry before it creates problems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you like, like the, 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 the hemp and the clay, the clay plasters, they have that property, they absorb excess moisture. And when it's warmer inside the house, like, you know, like, let's say in, um, in your bathroom. So you're going to go and have a shower, and then your clay walls or your straw bale or whatever material is going to absorb moisture and then when you're done and uh, the temperature inside the building is more dry than your wall then it releases the moisture and clay can be wet or damp I'll say without crumbling or or, or, or having any like negative consequences and so by using those materials in drywall, it'll absorb a lot of moisture, but it doesn't release it. It's, it's slow to release, and if it gets too wet, it just gets too mush. It becomes like, like a soda cracker. It just crumbles. It fails. Uh, it fails miserably, even. And so by using materials that do, are not affected by the, the moisture, you, uh, you avoid yourself a lot of problems. Uh, there's uh, new membranes now, which is um, the, the, the German membrane that I'm using. There's other ones, uh, Intello. So it's a poly, but it's a smart membrane. So it'll prevent wa uh, vapor from getting into my wall assembly, into my insulation. And there's something when the temperature is okay, like the, the, the pores of the membrane, they open up somehow. And so if there's any water or vapor in there, it'll dry, it allows for drying. So they, awesome. they, they call it a smart membrane. Uh, there's other, other products similar. So really like having water in your walls is a big, big problem. Part of why these old houses with no insulation have lasted so long is because they had no insulation. So they had unlimited drying potential. So, but they were cold, they were probably cold. So yeah, water would get in the wall, but there was nothing to damage, no insulation, and it would be wool to dry to the outside. The moment you put insulation in there, you want you, you need to think about controlling the vapor in your water. And then the and then the air control layer um, seems a bit <laughs> so again it's part of like controlling it's keeping your heat in. So if you're if you're having if you're creating like a, you have a fire you're heating your house, 
when you have the window open, well, you're not really heating your house. All of the heat is escaping to where it's colder because heat transfers from warm to cold. So you're wasting your time. Uh, similarly, if you have a hole in your wall, well, then the heat's going to transfer through that hole. Then there's other aspects of uh, pressure, di the pressure differentials like pr between the inside and the outside and then like the south side of your house and the north side of your house, there are different temperatures from the so solar radiation. So then there's convection and happening too. And there's, uh, uh, because also the convection, there's uh, the this, this stack effect. So like the hot air rises. So then there's like a suction at the bottom and a pressure uh, at, at the top. And if you want to have a good example of that, I go into an old drafty home and put plastic in the windows. And you'll see the plastic at the bottom, it's, it's bowing in. And you put plastic at the top and it's bowing out. But it's, you, you don't feel it, you don't see it. But there's, there's air movement happening all the time inside the house. Uh, but it's mostly to control, to, control uh, to maintain your heat and to not let also like the outside air in. Uh, like, like if there's contaminants or dust or things like that. Uh, and just like the, the analogy to, oh well, yeah, also if you, have a, if you have a hole in your air layer with the pressure, what happens is you're gonna have, what was it like, if you have a one inch hole into your assembly, all of the water vapor is gonna go through that one specific hole which is going to be like, that's, I'll say, like, I forget the exact number, like 30 liters of water a day of water vapor can go through that one hole. But if it's otherwise, it's going to be happening through diffusion. So it's going to be more like even in your house. But when you have like that one leak, that one hole, like it's all going to path of least resistance. And if the air is loaded with moisture, it's all going through there and it's going to decay the wood around there and do a all sorts of problems. But the, the, the easy analogy, that's a, a whole other thing, but the easy analogy to remember all of these layers is your, your own garments and clothing. If you're wearing a, a rain jacket, well, you're gonna, and you go outside in the winter with just your rain jacket, you're gonna be cold because there's absolutely no insulation. But if it's raining, you're gonna stay dry but right yeah but then oh but what's the option like what if you're wearing a wool sweater but if i'm wearing a wool sweater i'm going to be warm but the moment that there's wind i'm going to be cold again right but if i'm wearing a wool sweater and a rain jacket it's, you know, i'm getting i'm getting there but then i'm going to sweat and I'm, I'm just keeping my own body moisture inside the jacket so I'm just kind of delaying the process from the, from the performance of the wool, but it's going to happen regardless. Um, so the good uh, the good balance there is like uh, having a, like a dawn jacket or a, 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 and a Gore-Tex Gore-Tex layer. So I'm going to have my insulation layer keep me warm or a wool sweater. But you know, as long as like your outer shell is more like a Gore-Tex. I'm not trapping the moisture in, I'm letting it out, I'm not letting the wind through, and I have my insulation layer. So if you're able to remember like how you want to be comfortable, but well, the house is similarly, like if you want it to be comfortable, because if you're putting a lot of heat in, but it's all escaping, then it's gonna cost you a lot of uh, dollars or a lot of fuel for, for your fire or for your energy needs. and. So that's, that's why we need to think in these terms, it's like high performance and longevity, comfort, and yeah. Do you know if paint is considered a vapor barrier? Paint, some paints are considered a vapor barrier, yes. Uh, plywood, I think, is considered an air barrier. There, then the tapes, so that's where people, like, they put the, the, nowadays you put the plywood and you tape all your joints. Um, the other, the other, uh, the opposite is true too. Like some paints are vapor open, so they will let 
Vapor uh, walked through them. Uh, How about that Tyvek stuff? That Tyvek, that's uh, that's in the water control layer. Okay. And like uh, borderline vapor, like it's it's letting water out but not in. Oh, okay, that's okay. That's why it's on the uh, on the outside of your house. So even if it gets wet, but if there's wetness behind it, it's gonna weigh up. Yes, Jeff. Speaking of paint, have you ever heard of this product that they used? in the space program where it's microscopic ceramic beads that they add to latex paint and what it does you mix it in and it will actually reflect heat back okay so if you've got a heat source and it can be the human body or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and it actually works quite effectively a friend of ours uh, painted her uh, her art studio with it, and she was amazed at how how well it worked. Okay. She didn't do it on the ceiling though, and it kind of defeated the purpose because the temperature, you know, like the right. heat rose, right? Okay. But it's really inexpensive, and it works quite well. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of that too, but I don't know where to get the product. Just go online. Uh, do a you know a browser search. Just do ceramic beads plus latex paint okay. and they will list off the suppliers you buy the beads by the five gallon pail and add it to your paint and one gallon of this stuff will treat something like 50 gallons of paint wow. it it really goes a long way okay and it was like a hundred bucks i think for for a, a pail of this stuff so Probably it's worth looking into yeah okay and just like last note to finish on that. So then like we, we've touched on it many times throughout, but then there's like the, the concepts of uh, thermal mass and insulation. Mm -hmm. um, that I really want to make it clear for everybody like they know the difference. So uh, insulation is what's going to keep you separate from, from the rest. But thermal mass, now think of it in terms of conductivity. But but it'll take a lot of energy to heat up that material, but it will also take a lot of energy, it'll be able to release a lot of energy afterwards over a long time, over a long time period. And, uh, but the thermal, and the thermal mass it works in, uh, in conductivity, like direct contact, but also radiation. Because if you uh, if the sun heats up like your cob bench or your uh, your whatever your wall you have or your floor like your earth floor or your your, your your stone stone too I guess is a is a good example like your your tile floor the sun's gonna heat it up and then at night it's gonna radiate back out. Um, uh, 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 but given our our climate and circumstances. Uh, I'm pushing for having uh, good insulation all the way around your building, but then you put all of the thermal mass on the inside of that uh, that green layer. So, like by having um, like the earthen floor, I'm adding a lot of mass. It's a, it's a, it's a mass material. I'm adding a lot of mass inside my house. The drywall is a it's a lot of mass. It's a lot of it's a a half inch thick of dense material. However, it's also depending on your framing. It's also conductive, like it's re touch touching your siding, right. maybe potentially. Right. So it's a, it's a it could be good, it could be bad. But if it's if it ends up being inside, or uh, like what's the, uh, the the a cob fireplace to uh, or a cob oven. Not a cob oven, sorry. Rocket, rocket stove. stove. Like a rocket yeah. stove, you know, like those big fireplace or a mason masonry stove. Yeah. You want that inside your building. Like you can have lots of mass inside your buildings. Once it it can be warm, it'll stay warm. Same. But if you're if you're trying to use mass on the outside, um, it's a bit of an uphill battle. What happens is that. It's all, it's all about the temperature difference annually versus the temperature difference over a day. So over here, the temperature difference is, is happening over a year. 
we go from super hot to, well, from hot to cold over months, weeks or months. And so, and we're in a more warming climate, like I was saying, a heating climate, I mean. So we need to supplement our buildings with heat more than it is. As where if you go in New Mexico in the desert, where the, where the blazing sun is there all day. All day is cold nights. But yeah, it's cold at night. So then, by having the thermal mass on their, on their building, the building doesn't warm up instantly because all that mass is absorbing the heat. And then at night, when the sun is down, is then it's releasing the heat back into the room, so it's a more comfortable environment. So mass is, 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 is a good use of mass in that context. If they had insulation, they would be cold at night, they'd have to have a fire at night because they would have been insulating themselves from all the heat that they, was, they had available all day. So hopefully, hopefully it's clear like the difference between mass and insulation and like the, the, the uses of it. And that's why I wanted to uh, label some of these more structural and insulation depending on what it is. But it all depends on the context and where you are and how you're building too. Like, uh, and uh, uh, you were talking about a, a, having a root cellar. Right, so the root cellar is in, is in the mass of the earth. So what happens is you're not subject to the temperature differences that are happening throughout the year. You're in a more stable environment all the time. So you're avoiding the hot and cold, hot and cold. It's all kind of like, it's, it's pretty steady year round. But that's, that's by the inert nature of the mass. Because even though the sun is cooking the earth around your root cellar all day, but because the heat spreads over the entire surface of the earth or the, you know, your, your land, you don't, you don't feel the fluctuation happen like that. So it's all about the difference between during the day or during the year. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, let's go and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy a snack then. And That's perfect come back timing. After. Perfect yeah. timing. Guess who's here? Jay. Jay. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, we're ready. Kraken's a whip. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thanks everybody, and uh, thanks Crystal for the for the good lunch too. Great lunch. And, uh, as as everybody was uh, walking away, there was a question here that uh, come in about um, uh, vapor and air barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so that's the, 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 the six mil poly replacement that I use, which is that smart membrane. Mm -hmm. uh, that I was showing uh, Tyler. Tyler, thank you. Can and so it? that's a that's a directional membrane. So this with the the, the side that you can read is a side inside the room. The back side is different. That's like into in, into your wall. Otherwise, you'd be defeating the purpose. Can we feel and, it? Hmm? Can we feel it? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And then there's like the stats on it, like about the permeability. So it's like uh, zero, where is it? One, one per? Point one, one, point, point point 17 seven, perms. Uh, and then when the pores open, it becomes 13 perms. So what it means is that it's going to prevent vapor from getting in the wall, but then it's going to allow up to 13 perms or whatever the perms mean. Again, I, I can't recall, but like. It's gonna allow that, that diffusion, that, that, that release to happen. Versus the six mil poly, which is a, a vapor barrier in the classification. So it's got a permeability of 0 0.1, I think, similar to that membrane. So it's gonna prevent the vapor from getting in the wall, but it's gonna also, also gonna prevent the vapor from getting out of the wall at 0.1 perm rate of diffusion. So. Uh, and then um, there was a good good point too. Is like you don't need to use a ton of staples like when you're putting these kind of or is even a six mil poly. Sabrina. And I've been guilty of that on many job sites. Like, like <laughs> it's not satisfying. Like tuck, tuck, and it's just like a nice night tight membrane. And, um, but you're Thank you. creating punctures you in your envelope. Every staple is a puncture in your envelope, which has a potential of creating like that, you know, like a little hole in what it is, a little hole, depending on how tight it is to your stud. 
And so you, you don't always need to put as many staples as we think we, we need, because the moment you put the next layer up, if you're putting drywall, then you're gonna put in a, put in a screw every eight inches inside that same membrane to hold it up. Mm -hmm. So um, same when you're roofing, like if you're putting that membrane on your roof and you're putting, uh, well, whatever, even a uh, metal roof, you're gonna put like a screw every 12 inches down that membrane anyway. So you put enough to so that it's safe that you can walk on it, but you don't overdo it. Um, and then there's special tapes that go with that too. Um, which is a vapor open tape, which costs five times the cost of the, the tuck tape that you are, you're used to, uh, the red or the blue tuck tape. Um, but it's, it allows vapor diffusion uh, through it as well. Uh, Would it really matter for those little tiny spots to have it? Well, it's a, I don't know, it's a, I'll say it's a German, it's a ger the German package, right? <laughs> you know, I just like, I get the membrane and I get the, the tape that goes with it. And then uh, it's it's a hundred years of each. And then, uh, it's super strong. And that, that kind of tape too, uh, I've heard a story from an insulator. He had a, a cracked radiator hose and they put some of that tape around it and they were able to make it to town and they drive back to the shop and whatever. And he had a, a cracked windshield washer reservoir and he put some of that tape on and like six years later, it's still leak free. So, Thank you. I don't, you know, like the tuck tape, it, would, it wouldn't go through that. that uh, abuse. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, a bit above the the the, the, the binders, since it's already up. Uh, the, the different binders for a plaster or for a cob or for your earthen floor. The principles are the same. You have the aggregate, and that gives you um, that gives you your compression strength. Um, and then you have the fiber, which will give you your tension strength or tensile strength. Then you have your binder, which is the the glue it keeps every it keeps uh, it keeps the aggregate together, and it keeps the fiber together. Again, a, a triangle relationship here. And um, aggregate aggregate that will be uh, sand, rocks, pebbles, that kind of thing. Concrete, concrete is uh, stone, sand, and of different sizes and cement as a binder. Sometimes uh, if you're doing a slab or uh, you don't want, you want to minimize crack or movement, you'll put fiber or you'll put the rebar, like the half inch rebar. So that's, that gives you your, the tensile strength in, your, in, in, in there. So that's, that's what people may be already familiar with. So, uh, similarly, in your cob, mix or your earthen floor mix or your plaster mix it's the same thing we're, we're going to put some sand some fine sand we're going to put some clay and then we're going to put some fiber and then it's also up to you whatever is available in your area or easily accessible what kind of fiber are you going to put like in in asia in california they grow a lot of rice they use rice rice straw here in Creston, they have lots of farms there. There's uh, wheat straw that's available. In other places, there'll be barley straw. Um, I have an example over there too. Uh, cattail, <laughs> the, the head, the fluff of the cattail. That's a kind of fiber. They give you the hemp, the, the hemp fiber. That's another fiber. So if you remember this, th these relationships, you can play with it now. Now you can decide, I'm going to use uh, lime as my binder, some form of aggregate and some form of fiber, and play with that in different ratios and see how that holds up. Or I'm going to use the clay, I'm going to use a finer sand, and then uh, the hemp fiber, and how does that react, how does that behave? So like, there's going to be all these subtleties that are going to take place, but 
the principles in, in essence it's the same uh, and even with this um, to a, to a degree but I will also, I would almost cut that and be like that's more like you'll be more on the insulation scale and you'll be more on the thermal mass side so there's a bit of that separation there too because um, as we've talked about like cob is mostly there's there's some fiber in it and all of that and i'm not saying that your plasters are going to give you some insulation properties but it's just in that in that relationship or like straw bale is mostly fiber so it's more insulative than if you have a more more heavy aggregate heavy uh, mix the different uh, binders that you will find uh, would be clay lime gypsum and cement and they have like different vapor permeability that we we're uh, talking uh, about before lunch there they have different resistance to the weather and different difference uh, different structural strengths hopefully you can read from there so uh, clay clay is very very vap vapor open uh, it'll suck in the moisture and it'll release it allow it to, to move it's not very resistant to the weather so uh, as an external plaster or if it gets wet it'll uh, erode the, the sand away it'll wash off um, and you want to you want to minimize uh, exposure to rain, so by having big, big, wide, big overhangs, or by just by not using it low to the ground, uh, so you could like just keep the lower three feet. Yeah, I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, thank you. Go, uh, lower three feet could be metal siding or rock, rock work, rock veneer, and then you have your clay, your clay wall. But this also applies to your bathroom, your kitchen. Uh, where there's a lot of splashing over time if it gets really wet repeatedly you will see some more uh, degradation of it however you can fix it you can like get it get the whole thing wet again have your new mix and you can like plaster a new coat on it and it looks fresh you can, you can repair it uh, but it doesn't have much stru much structural strength um, you'll see in some of the samples um, they just crumble, right? Like I have, a, I have a clay ball over there, like the pure clay that we got ex that we extracted from the <laughs> from the ground. And if you like take it and drop it on the ground, it's just gonna smash. Like there's not a strong adhesion bond uh, or a structural Before it's bond. Dry. Yeah, when it well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you had a question. What is gypsy? Gypsum. That's a white mineral that's mined. I forget where there's a lot of there's a mines uh, for that, um, but it's a it's a mineral. Oh. I, don't, I don't know know much more about that. Mm. I had a question about clay. Is there is there any building with clay that you actually like heat it up to where it like kiln dries it to where it's like almost like porcelain? Do you, have you ever heard of it that? It could be. I mean, like they make clay tiles for roofing. Right. So, uh, but I, but not all clays are the same. Right. So I'm not going. In, I don't. I'm not an expert in the different types of clay. But there's like the fired clays and the natural clays and the this kind of clay and this kind of clay. Right, it's different. So they're different, and so that's why when you're using site soil or site harvested clay, you need to do some tests to figure out the properties of that specific clay. Some will swell more when they're wet. Some will crack more than others. Uh, the color is different too, and the, the properties of the different clays are it changes. I yes. think if you fire it, it makes it more prone to like if it gets broken, it'll shatter, shatter right? Because yeah. you think of like a, a porcelain yeah. pot or something. Yeah. Whereas Plus, that doesn't happen with clay plaster on the walls because it's not. Yeah. Okay. The I'm a potter. I've tried doing self-firing sculptures, so you can make a hollow sculpture that's big enough to build a fire in, and you can actually kind of fire the sculpture, wow. which would be the same as, as a building, but you can't 
you can't get the temperature high enough oh. to really vitrify the clay, which would make it waterproof, um, without having, basically, you're building a chimney. You know, you have to have a ton of draw, and you've got to be able to build a hot enough fire. It has to be a thousand degrees Celsius wow. to to <laughs> vitrify um, earthenware, 1200 degrees to vitrify porcelain. So you're not going to get that kind of a temperature. Okay. Building a raccoon killer around it or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a giant raccoon I tried that, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, but you raccoon can. doesn't get hot enough either. No. Not it's even like close. Degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Jeff, you have a question, I think? Have you ever uh, used water glass? Well, we were talking about that. It's a, a liquid waterproofer that you can For clay. paint on. For clay. Oh, okay, yeah, there's additives and you can add to your yeah. plasters. So then it's anything. not as like volatile with water. Silicane, I think, is one. Sodium I silicate, I think, is yeah. what water glass is. Yeah, you can yeah. add additives that would increase the... The water resistance uh, yeah. to yeah. the, yeah, for sure, there's additives that you can do. Um, even like horse manure and car manure and whatever. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll get. Uh, so lime, lime is another binder. That's what we've used for hempcrete. Uh, again, that's limestone that's harvested and mined and crushed and pulverized and Heat it up to a certain temperature. There's different kinds of limes. There's uh, the natural. There's hydraulic lime and hydrated lime. In North America, we don't have hydraulic lime. It's in Europe and in, uh, in France, I think. There's a natural, naturally occurring hydraulic lime. What is hydraulic lime? It'll, it'll. I think. It has like similar properties to concrete in the way that when it gets wet, the way it cures or sets. And I, I could, there's a difference between cure and set, and I'm, I'm confusing the two often, so I'm not sure on that. Um, the way concrete works, it's like, uh, it's basically, it's like a round molecule and another round molecule, and they start to grow little fingers. So as, as they dry out, the crystal forms and that locks it together. And then there's ways to slow it down or to coat it so that it actually just doesn't do that. So you can get a lubricant that will help it move. But mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's similar in line to right. okay. to Portland cement, then it'll be a crystalline formation. Okay, but I think that's like more so. naturally occurring versus the hydrated lime. So it's cross pulverized and heated up, but then they cool it down with water rapidly. And they stop. They stop the process of the lime. I say crystallizing, but uh, setting until it gets wet again. And then when you get it wet, then you're reactivating that 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 process, that reaction, yeah. until it sets fully. Um, the exact science of it, I'm not the right person to ask that, but uh, there's different. And uh, you can get that at the <laughs> farmer's supply too. Like I. There's a big plant in Eggshaw uh, near Calgary. That's where we got the lime from for uh, our hempcrete uh, project. And big, big pallets and big bags and uh, um, clay. You don't need any safety. Where do you, I mean, you don't want to breed the dust. There would, there could be like other trace, uh, like minerals or substances in the clay dust too like uh that could be toxic and you don't want to ingest that but the lime is very caustic is is very alkaline so you need to wear gloves and long sleeves and your goggles and a mask because when you get that dust in your nostrils like it it burns because your body is reacting to the alkalinity and it's producing the mucus and then if you get it in your eyes, your eyes are just burning like crazy. And then um, when you get it on your skin, like it's like a concrete burn. Like it'll like the heat, but it it's just a reaction, and you can't get the heat off. Like you get a soak in water and wait. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it is more more weather resistant. So that's why it's been used for a long time for exterior plasters and finishes. It resists uh, longer. 
that again, like if it if it really degrades, you can add another code on it. I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure of the level of that that you can repair it per se, but you can add another code on top of it and then get rid of your uh, your stuff. And like some older buildings, like probably more in Europe, like there's probably like a couple inches of the of lime uh, lime render over the the years of the maintenance of the buildings. Um, um, and then it's more structurally uh, integral. Gypsum that we use in the drywall. So it's very comparable to clay, like vapor permeable. It doesn't react to, uh, for anybody who's done renos or in a bathroom and if it gets wet or it just crumbles and mushes, it's got no structural integrity at all. You're trying to pull the whole sheet and you're just getting like a little corner off and uh, it doesn't work really well, and it's uh, got no strength. And then uh, cement. So well, that's why it's very popular because it's got a high <laughs> weather resistance and very high, uh, high structural strength. However, it is not vapor permeable, and so that's why I'm wondering with aircrete how. But aircrete, you get all these air pockets in it, but I'm not sure how that would. I don't have. I haven't done enough research about like <coughs> the, the, the porosity. Yeah, it doesn't really breathe. From what that's I that's what I would think too yeah. from from these numbers, and so that would also be like to consider yeah, you your use of it and where you or you what's going to happen. Oh, but what I was like also forgot to to mention too with the uh, the schematics of all the the, the four layers when you have a, a proper air control layer, then you, you, you kind of say that your building is airtight, uh, which is what you're, you're shooting for. But then when you're really airtight, nowadays the buildings are so airtight that you it's mandatory to have mechanical ventilation. So they don't let you just say, I'm going to open the windows when I, once in a while, like, like, and then they sell you like a ten thousand uh, dollar heat recovery ventilation system because if you're just if you just have an exhaust fan to bring in fresh air, then you're bringing in cold air in the winter. So then you're losing performance in your, from your from your thermal layer. Uh, so the heat recovery, the channels like it sucks it sucks the cold air in in the same channel that is pushing the hot air out. To create the balance, otherwise you would be pressurizing your house. And then the heat exchange from one going across the one another, the heat transfers to the colder air. So then you're not sucking in cold air, you're sucking in like more like lukewarm or warm air. So nowadays they have like heat recover heat recovery ventilation systems that are 90% efficient. That's pretty standard. I heard of a system that's over unity, like 100 and six percent efficiency don't know how that works but so that's in a way that's kind of saying your house is ten percent less efficient or what in warm warm uh, factor because you got to change replace the air in it uh, and there's a no oh, I forget but the passive house standard is like point zero five air exchange an hour but like the standard house is more like eight. So like the, the imagine that the entire air of this room is replaced eight times in one hour versus like a passive house, which is like only half of it. So it's very, very, very airtight. But then if you live in that house, you'll be suffocating because of the carbon, uh, carbon monoxide. So there's like the ventilation that comes in. Uh, there's that too. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. So if you got like a cement, like the a cement dome, where air, it's airtight and it doesn't let the vapor go through, so then you need mechanical. I would think, I would suggest you need mechanical ventilation to balance the equation again. Yeah, or air intake something. Air tube. Yeah. But you need you need to offset offset that, otherwise you just create a. I'm not a fishbowl, but what's the, a damp environment over time, yes, yeah? So, okay, before lunch, you had talked about if you have a hole in the wall, yeah. 
it it's offering the least amount of resistance and so you have a lot of the humidity that's built up inside of the house uh -huh. well why wouldn't you take advantage of that like actually put like PVC or something that isn't going to uh, rust and I'm just saying like you could vent off the excess humidity that's built up in the house like you do that on yeah. purpose yeah well that's what the mechanical systems do right and they, uh, they regulate the moisture at the same time and they do, but it's it's expensive and you need to have ducting and this and this and that but you said it happens naturally no, though but you lose all your heat yeah, that's yeah, true. That's, that's true. Thing, yeah, yeah and you right. Know, you, you, the idea is you want to control what's going on in your house. You don't want to just wing it to the weather or whatever other external forces are around, I guess. But um, otherwise, just leave your window. Or you leave your window open, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're not, it's not going to happen. But then you're losing all your heat. So mm -hmm. But yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, if you passed it through. Uh, like okay, if you if you have a wood stove, could you not put it through the exhaust? Like put it through the stove pipe, warm the air, and warm the air as it's going out. So now it's serving two purposes. It's venting off the. <laughs> that would be one way around it for sure. Yeah. There's the earth tubes. Uh, if people know about that, where so it's uh you have your air intake way out there, and you're taking advantage of the. I said the mass of the earth, so yep. the air is not what's above the earth. It gets warmed up underneath the ground there as mm -hmm. it comes out. That's that's more and more passive HRV uh, system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you can have uh, yeah, but that's that's something to consider too. Like if you're just encapsulating yourself, like you're breathing, you're living in that space. Um, but that's why that's why it's, okay. And then what else? The binder is that. Oh, I'm curious. Before we get we get out there, like um, I was wanting to use the resources that are around you. That's something like, um, and I kind of want to go around the room too to like have a bit of a think tank. Um, what what do you think are some of the natural resources available in the area? And so sometimes too, like. If it's a byproduct of an industry that you can get easily or for free. Concrete for me. Yeah. All the time. Lots of concrete. <laughs> free. Yeah. How do you get free? Uh, well, I finish concrete, so a lot of times guys want to measure up their own and they end up uh, ordering a lot more than they actually needed, so I'll right. end up with the balance on the truck. And but then you'll have to have forms or something to have a quarry. I've got a big quarry that I've just been dumping it in and turning into a skate park. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's so yeah. In other words, you're a good person to know around here. Yeah, if you like skateboarding, <laughs> come on up. Eventually, there'll be a pretty sweet snake run. Wow. Maybe <laughs> maybe cool. All the kids um, will be there. Fifty thousand yeah. dollar free skate park. <laughs> 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 Sign a waiver. It's not my not my money. <laughs> Wood is probably the most efficient around because there's so much of it. Yeah. yeah. Weed. Oh yeah. Weed. <laughs> we have a, right. um, a pole yard up in the Cospen, and uh, you can get all of the the bark and yeah, yeah, yeah. remainders for free. That's what we used for the house that we built, uh, whatever it was, 12 years ago. Yeah. It was 400 bucks. I think that was the total amount that we spent on. Materials. On uh, materials that was including a dump from the pole yard. Holy cow, right? wow. Yeah, there is also <laughs> like it's good clay, cheap. but not right where we were building. We were building on shale, so uh, but they were building a road somewhere and had a bunch of clay. So all we had to do was pay for the dump truck. Yeah, wow. yeah. Didn't even pay for the product. It was just for the delivery. You could literally go there with your truck, and they would fill it up for you. They have a big loader and. They're just That's happy to get rid of it. Yard, yeah. 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 The yard, they're full. Uh, yeah. Full. They keep expanding their yard. Uh, yep. <laughs> there are lime deposits too, but I, I don't know what the quality of the lime is. You'd have to probably dissolve it in muriatic acid with it and find out if it's actually a uh, usable material. Uh huh. Yeah. So we take testing. Yeah. Is there a board at 93 Park? 
<laughs> there will be. It's it's only just in the beginning stages. But. Like what's up there right now? Uh, pretty much a hole in the ground with some rough concrete laid down to fill in spaces between the rocks and. <laughs> sort of thing will happen in the future. Yeah, it's gonna be a few years. And uh, I don't know. Maybe like there's maybe there's coffee shops or restaurants. Maybe they have stuff or that can be used for a building material. Um, we have a friend in Samo. Uh, he heard about the tree planters, little styrofoam trays oh, that yeah. all the saplings come mm -hmm. in, and they just like back then they were just like you got a B train full for free. So he decided to use that for building his house because that was easily available to him and it was free. And then he, he built it up like Lego and then like poured concrete through it and like finished, stuck out the whole thing. Another good example of that is in Winlaw where I was there for water day to took my mom down there. And it just past Mama Cedas, there's, if you go down to the road that takes you across the bridge there, the woman has that whole wall and it looks like a stucco wall next yeah, to the road. Yeah, yeah. She did that. So she invited us in and told us everything, and she used that, that tree planting, those sapling okay. star poems, and she sure. built yeah. that whole wall, yeah, and wall then stuckled over it, and then yeah. that's exactly a good example of... And I was thinking of using that maybe for a root cellar, because that would be a... Star, I'm not keen on like styrofoam, yeah. right, because of the, uh, the petrochemical uh, and uh, environmental... Uh, but it's also, well, it's got very good, very, very good insulative properties. It's hydrophobic. Semi-structural, like a, depending on the, the type of it, so you don't put too much weight on it. So, um, yeah, there's, there's some sawmills here, like maybe like wood fiber or uh, 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 the cants, like when they open the log too, like the cants, maybe you can use that for a fencing or for a floor or for like, uh, siding, uh, um, would be ways like that. Um, and that was across the Hare Proctor Ferry, I think, where they do those tree yeah. saplings, and they said you can just go there with like a truck and just get as many as you want. I called beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, that's where he, that's where our friend got his. In he said though you have to have a. It's like a full palette. Yeah. They won't just give you but like. For Tyler, that might be. Yeah, real trailer. And that was another um, <coughs> instance where it's good to plan your structure for the type of material. Like he said, he yeah. built his root cellar and he knew there's this many in a palette, so he built it to those specs so that he could use up the whole thing and not have. Leftovers. Yeah, leftovers or not have enough, so it just worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. If there's leftovers, you can always burn the styrofoam. It's really good for the sky. <laughs> Is it for campfires? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll invite you. And if you put it on a stick. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's all not true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, so like maybe there'll be something that'll come up. I like keep. It's not because we're talking about things here today, or that it's not. There's not. There isn't a book about it. Pretty sure Doug will give you all the tires you want. Yeah, you can't be married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tire it depends. It's also tires. It's labor intensive, uh, though. It's yeah. very labor intensive. Everybody who I've heard who's done it, they they wouldn't do it twice. <laughs> they don't want to see us No. Again. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. It's like, hey, come over for my work party. <laughs> yeah. Uh, party. I think it was an excuse <laughs> just to <laughs> use up party. tires, right? They were yeah. they were tired of seeing them in li landfills, yeah. so they've tried to come up with a use for it. Uh, you had mentioned to remind you about building panels. Okay, is this the I, good I time to do that? I, I felt it. Okay, okay. you're so, psychic. Uh, good. Uh, 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 yeah, there's a there's a book about it too. Got Chris Magwood, and uh, it's it's becoming more. Po it's there's companies in Europe that do that prefabricated straw bale wall panels. Mm. And this is like, I wanted like when I saw that after taking the course, I wanted to start a business doing that, and I researched all the machinery and equipment that we need to do that. Ultimately, you still need a bit of capital to get started, and like you need to make sure there's a market. Uh, but you also need a warehouse or a storage space because once your walls are made, you need to keep them dry until they're under a roof. Uh, so the, and it's, the panelization, it's 
very common in uh, commercial and, and industrial construction. So what it is, is instead of coming on site and having a load of two by fours and two by six and making your, your walls and lifting your wall and then you get another pile of two by six and you make another wall, you, uh, you prefabricate all of your walls off site or, you, or somewhere, right? Where you have the space, like you can be under a shelter, your covered space, anyway you can work year round depending on, it's kind of like the, uh, 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 mobile homes, they're made in a warehouse under controlled conditions and you just slap it up when they, and then they roll it out to, your, to your, your build site. So you still build your walls like you, would, you normally would. Uh, you need to label and identify your walls. You, you need to plan your electrical and plumbing accordingly because if some walls might need some conduits in your walls depend, or um, so you can do some of that ahead of time. Uh, you don't put your windows in right away because that'd be a risk for transport. And so with a straw bale uh, panel, you would do the, um, the Larson truss wall system. And then uh, you work on it on flat. So you can even have like a nice work table so you're at a good height. And you have like, your, your, your stud there and then um, Depending on how you fit and your top plates connecting your walls together, uh, top and bottom plates connecting the two the two sides, and then and you put your straw bale in in between, and you pack it, and you know, and you you build your wall as you would normally. And then the beauty of it is that well, you're gonna make sure it's tight and like I'll I'll scoop them in uh, snug, but the beauty of it is then you can pour your plaster on that flat face or um, your clay plaster or and then you you can even screed it nice and flat all across the face you wait you let it cure you let it set when it's ready with your machine or crane lift the panel and you can put it aside uh, I think at that point, if you were to tip it back and try to work on the other face, I think you risk maybe like something falling off. Um, maybe you can put stakes or big screws to keep it together. That's uh, something to explore. Uh, some wall system, if you're going to do like a conventional siding, you would have your, your, uh, your plywood on the bottom before you put your straw bales in. And then you can plaster, so you have like your, your inside wall is already half plastered or three, like, you know, it's already like your very coat is already done and, and ready to, to deal with. And so you would do all of your wall panels ahead of time, store them away. And once your foundation is set and you got your roof material ready, <laughs> then you, you, you call in a crane for half a day and it's like wall one, wall two, wall three, wall four, tuk, 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 go across like that. You tie it all in together as you go, and you brace it, make sure it's all plumb and straight, and you're ready to put your roof on it. And so they've done, they, and there's even like a, in the book, they did a crazy building where they prefabricated the entire roof system on the ground. Hmm. And then they had a giant crane, hmm. and then they took the entire roof and they go like, boop. And then like within the day, the building was like, it went from having a foundation to having a building ready to like wow. with a roof on it in a day i saw a log house builder do that it seemed like kind of an odd choice to you know this massive big chunky thing you're trying to get up on top of yeah when you it's not that bad to build it up higher <laughs> but um even in, in the res commercial residential construction apartment buildings what i've seen done too is like the, the roof trusses well in, even in the cluster was done like that even You'll set up like uh, the roof trusses and you'll build up a section of like 20 feet. Right. And then the crane will lift that 20 foot section, drop it in, then you're ready to build up your next 20 foot section and you move it up. So it's, it's way easier to work on the ground and way safer yeah. than being in a harness and like dropping stuff on people below. And <laughs> Or ideally not, it's but faster. You know, there, 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 there are less, yeah. lesser faster. risks to working on the ground. Yeah. It's more comfortable, it's less tiring. 
Um, but so you can make your panels like that. And I'm pretty confident you can do the same with a hempcrete panel. If you have like a steady base, so you could do it on the ground, I guess, but it's because like from the packing of it, you don't want it to knock down. So you'd have a solid work platform. You could prefab, prefab uh, your hempcrete walls. You st store them away, stack them away. You can even do like the coating on the one side. Uh, you could you could sheet them if you, you decide you want plywood on both sides of your wall. You do it right then and there. Mm -hmm. Put your wall your wall panels away, and then when it's go time or when the weather's good, or you could you could work on all the, your wall system in the winter if you have a space for it or a shop or, and then come spring like go and then it's it's ready to go. So you're limiting the exposure or the chances of rain hitting your straw bales or your hempcrete or whatever whatever you're building. They do that like with normal walls too and they, they stuff the insulation, they stuff the wire, like some rough wiring, rough plumbing. Uh, you can frame your wall to have a chase so it's a separate cavity for all your plumbing and wiring so it's outside of your, your wall which makes it even more airtight. And then uh, once you bring the panels in, it's just like that Sometimes you keep just that chase at the bottom where you're going to have your bottom trim and all your wiring is going down there and then you just cap it with your trim and you have your wall there. So panelization, there's definitely like something to, to, to look into, into that. If you, have, you need the space in the room, like a crane or a tractor or something to lift your panels and move them around. Uh, but he did that like, and in Europe they do that a lot now, like straw bill uh, panels straw bill wall panels, there's EcoCon, and there's another company that does it. Um, not in Hungary, in Austria, I think there was one. <laughs> there used to be one anyway. Who knows what's going on? There's a company in Nescu that does, uh, they do, it's like a steel, steel stud frame, and then they put styrofoam insulation, and then they flip it over, <clears throat> pour concrete on it, like an inch and a half layer, and then run a power trowel over it, finish it, and they're four by eight sheets that are insulated with the uh, with the stud and the finished wall. So it's like a, a sip, a sip. Yeah, panel. it's not natural building techniques, yeah, but yeah. it's like the whole panel is there and then all your conduit, everything runs in between the studs and there's an air right. gap between the insulation yeah. and the, and the uh, material that's yeah, yeah. protected from weather. Yeah, yeah. And even though like concrete, fine. concrete is not preferred method but the concrete industry is so so broad like worldwide the concrete industry has many tools and techniques that we can borrow from and use and and take from like it's just the choice of material which is very energy uh well energy usage for it yeah i just wanted to share something that's a little off topic but uh on my ex and i we um we owned property in ireland and we had a house that was about 900 years old sitting on that property and I just wanted to um, mention, I, sorry, it is a little off topic, but it like literally lasted 900 years. Uh -huh. So uh, what I thought was really cool was that it was in like semi-bog, like peat moss, uh, peat or something. And so it had been preserved and it was like semi in the ground. And um, what I was sharing, just what I wanted to share was that like, they had built it of um, mostly clay, like cob, I guess, and stone, a lot of stone as well, and the walls were like quite thick. Mm -hmm. And I mean, literally like 900 years old, that house yeah. is still standing, it is still there. Right <laughs> yeah. But anyway. If it's done well, it can last, and there's probably been maintenance that's been done on that house over the years for sure to upkeep it because, uh, but you know, minim probably minimal and then it's minimal. still, it's still it's lasts. It's quite yeah. minimal actually. Yeah. Like shocking how, how uh, well it's held up. It's probably Maryland. The, door, the doors, the, the doorways were this, like this high. Uh -huh. yeah, they used yeah. to do the weird they roof, the like, thatchet roof, where they like yeah. bind grass and then like wrap it in, in like bowls like that. Yeah. And just like stack it up so it's like that thick. They do that in the Philippines, but it's, it's tropical weather, right? So it's like, they would just get grass and like 
tie them up. And yeah, well, that's stack that's. It. I'm like, wow, that's your roof. Yeah. That's a, a sustainable resource and it grows, it's abundant. Yeah. yeah. And it grows and now it works. It's a, it's a positive lap of all the strands of grass or straw. So the water falls on the one straw yeah. and then it, you gotta have enough slope that it goes down enough before it hits the other one. It goes down enough and then you wanna mm -hmm. zigzag the water to zigzag its way Oh. out before it gets into your oh. on the bottom layer but you're going to redo these roofs about tw every 25 years yeah. or so you're going to replace the place the airport it was like i think banana leaves the whole roof or something <laughs> yeah yeah it was open it was, it was pretty cool yeah it was, it was a, cool. the positive lap which you shut the water away yeah it and makes then, sense when you yeah. just said that yeah but yeah. you wouldn't be able to do that here i don't think because of the snow well, the snow would be an issue for sure. Yeah, yeah. it would probably ice stick ice to the straw and ice dam and two that would move it up. Um, and the constant melting and refreezing, yeah. expanding. Well, the the First Nations didn't they use cedar bow or they used? I was like looking up pit houses and a bridge bar. Was it birch? Yeah, I think it was cedar and birch together. Maybe they were like uh, they were weaving it. For how pit much houses. longer till? How much longer till we can hold the clay? Just about where just uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking too of uh, green roofs, which yeah. is like mm -hmm. super sexy looking. Mm -hmm. You have like you're you're growing vegetables and flowers on your house. Right, right. Um, some of the constraints of it is your house ends up having or your roof ends up having to support a lot of weight. A lot of weight. Um. You have a lot of weight from all that sand and all the different layers because. Um, uh, if you want to do it well, you would have a bit of a grid matrix for a drainage plane so that the excess water gets out. It doesn't stay, sit on the roof and then you got to factor in, okay, like I'm going to have all that sand and all that water potentially, right, if, if it's a rainy day. And then um, you're limited in the roof pitch that you can have. It's about like 312 or 15 degrees. Anything steeper than that, you risk your dirt wa washing off and oh, away right. from your roof. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so then like, you would be holding snow because it would be sliding, the snow would be falling off. Uh, there's a lot of detailing to, to prevent, you know, the dirt from falling on all sides and falling down for the, the rainwater to exit. And then, uh, to do it well, you need to have an expensive EDPM, like rubberized membrane, that you line your roof with. So, so that's, that's and that roof membrane is resistant, but it needs to be covered with soil, otherwise, like the UV will degrade it. Mm. Yeah, there's the mm. fiber fiber bales too that you roll out, and it's yeah fiber mesh for drainage goes on top of it. And I know that stuff's not cheap either. Right. It's pretty, yeah. pretty pricey. So the then mail. there's there's the the limitations of it. It's super. I would like that. I would like it too. And then it's a bit cost <coughs> cost prohibitive. And then like by having a lot of weight on your roof, that means your roof has to be more solid. Yeah. But then your walls are holding your roof. So then you need your walls to be more solid. And then your foundation is holding your your walls. And therefore your roof and uh, the so you need a, a beefy foundation, and that's how you work out the engineering of a of a house. You start from the roof down, the opposite order of construction. <laughs> so you start, what is going to be supported from the top down? Okay, that's the kind of foundation I need. And then I can build a foundation and build it up. Hmm. So, Have you ever done any research on the rubble trench foundation? Oh, uh, very little, but it's very appealing. And, uh, oh, that makes me think too. If, if you only have one book to buy, uh, with all of other these, I would say build, uh, get this one, The Natural Building Companion. That's, that's like the, the school, the, 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 how do you call that? When you go to school, one of your books for... Uh, textbook. Okay, it's the textbook for this, for someone else's, um, for the that Yes Tomorrow School Natural Building course, like however long their course is. It's their textbook, so it'll cover it'll cover everything uh, we've 
cover it today and then like go in depth into about a lot more things too. So if you only have like one book to buy, like it's, it's pretty broad, but like very technical and in depth about a lot of things, like that would be the one. If not, then uh, get the book related to what you're really like keen on. Keen on. Uh, but the rubble trench, so what it is, is um, instead of having your a concrete foundation, you would have just a, a trench. Um, so this is your, your ground, your grade. You have a trench. And let's say that your house is, uh, is going to be sitting here. Yeah. That's your house. So instead of having concrete down here with your, with your footing, your drain, so all it is is you have rubble, like uh, aggregate stone rocks. That's all it is. The whole way down, you still have like your drainage, and you have a. There's there's a detail and a schematic in that book too, and like the do it how to do it properly with the, uh, the cloth. Anyway, you need to have your cloth, and so sand doesn't get in your drain and doesn't get in here. And so what it does is if if it rains, well, water will dry. It'll never make its way under your house. It'll just like get hit the trench and come straight down. And then you and then you drain it out of out of there, and so you're you're preventing the water and moisture from getting, or excess moisture from getting under your house, and then because it's an aggregate which is high in compress compressive strength, it's enough to support your house. Uh, usually, what they'll do like they'll do a perimeter beam, so they'll do like a concrete beam that the house is going to sit on, so it's a it's a huge reduction in the use of concrete because you don't have that, that's called a stem wall in the footing. So you, you eliminate that from your build. And you would have uh, the frost line, which around here is about two feet. You can go like three feet to be safe, depending on the 100 year old, 100 year mega frost or something. <laughs> so, so then you want your rubble trench and every foundation to go below the frost line because what happens for sure there's going to be moisture in the ground here as it freezes it'll swell and it'll move and it'll lift your building but if you, your building is sitting beneath the frost line it won't lift your building it'll lift the ground everywhere around it but it won't lift your building yeah, but drainage then the water has somewhere to go so yeah out to the open and, uh, what's the frost line is it different everywhere or? <coughs> Yeah, like so here in the Kootenays, it's about two feet. Depending on temperature. The, the, the different um, building bylaws, like they specify the frost depth. Oh, okay. So like even like when you're running like plumbing from, from your well to the house or from the creek to the house, it, you have to be below the frost line. In Regina now, they're saying it's only safe at 16 feet. Which is ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. That's for like just doing like a front porch, like not so even right. a, you know, oh like your, your main structure. Yeah. Just, just to have like, I don't know, that seems pretty deep. That's to, like insane. That's like, you don't want to move there. Over. Just well, it's, read it's between the lines. You don't want to move like there at all. <laughs> so it, the ground's always, it's basically liquid. Yeah. yeah. It's like building on. Water. Yeah. And uh, I know in Alberta, Calgary, it's eight feet. Yeah. But but how they avoid that now? They call it a floating. It's called a float. Mm -hmm. So you just you just build a <laughs> you build a concrete mass. Uh, so a side view. You would have a, a thickening. So that's that's all concrete. But on the edges where where you got the weight, it's a little thicker, and you're kind of just floating over the ground so if something moves like if the whole thing moves as one one unit wow. um, yeah hmm. and you still want you still want to put like your some insulation and like detach your foundation from from the ground the rubble trench um, because you wouldn't have a basement or a crawl space or anything, you wouldn't be insulating other than like just at the front of your perimeter beam. 
So there's a bit of cost saving there too, and uh, maybe even time. Uh, and yeah, any kind of excavation, eventually you get, you get some sand and some rock or... Uh, that we've been discovering lately is all about the whole radon issue. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. um, how I, what I did not realize is that you can actually get a, a pocket of radon build up underneath your slab, and because the concrete is vapor permeable, the radon comes through the concrete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to talk to the guy about how to. So what they do is they create a low pressure air pocket underneath your slab where all the radon gets sucked into mm -hmm. and then they vent it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you make a, a non-permeable vapor barrier under this, your slab so that it can't come up through. Yeah, and you still put a radon pipe in. Like it's all, there's a lot of aggregate, right. thicker stuff. And then the radon pipe is in there, and that's perforated, and then it vents right out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, yeah. yeah, so I was just thinking, like, in an area where you have a problem with radon, building a crawl space or a basement isn't necessarily a good idea because you're no. just basically creating a radon collector. Yeah, yeah, and they ask for that too, and that's also the reason why you put the poly underneath your any concrete yeah. work you do. It's to prevent, like, it's a cap capillary break, prevent moisture from getting from underneath and also for the radon gas. But before you pour the slab, they're going to make you, and it's it's in the code, you need to have, like, a way to exit, for radon gas to exit. It's 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 embedded in the code, I don't think you can get away. It's a problem with living in a hundred-year-old house. Uh, have like, you thought about that? For, Did you get for, it tested? Yeah. And there is radon coming out. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, okay. um, but it's not... A lot of people just crack a window in the basement. Yeah, it's not that bad, but it is... It, apparently it's still considered dangerous, it used though. To be, mm -hmm. used to be acceptable, but they dropped the oh. acceptable level, so now it's considered not acceptable. And for us in our situation, we are, we're in the floodplain, and the water table has changed since the house was built because we could not have been building in the mud like it is now. <coughs> There's water coming in constantly like from underneath the house and like if the sump pump stops running I have 16 inches of water. But so what we've uh, what we're gonna end up doing is when we're, we're at that stage just gonna bring in lots of aggregate we're gonna it's a, just a crawl space it's not a right, finished so you're just basement. Fill it up. And so we're gonna, it's five feet high right now. So I'm gonna bring in like two feet of gravel and then do the, the radon thing that they're asking, like the pipe and the this and the poly. And then I'm gonna pour a concrete topper and seal it up that way. So I'm gonna lose some headroom. I'm finishing. I wonder if wait till I'm done my plumbing and electrical and I need all the headroom. <laughs> then I can think about that. The poor concrete finishers that are gonna have to get in there, man. <laughs> you don't have to go finish that that poor. <laughs> just screen it and call it done. Yeah, yeah. just like we'll hire uh, they've, you. they've got self leveling and self finishing now. So at some point I might not have a job anymore. <laughs> Like, you, you can switch to Send in the little Makita yeah. power yeah. robot. Yeah. There. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. You, just, you just pour it in, literally. You pour it, you rake it, and it will finish like uh, near top, basically. Wow. Like okay. Yeah, it's super expensive. It's right. cheaper to get a finisher than it is to get the concrete, but still. Maybe you, at that point you could switch to earthen floors. Yeah, yeah something else. <laughs> but you know back, what? Go back to tree service full time. Yeah, but earthen floors, it's like a... Uh, It'd be comparable to uh, well, let's touch on that. No, it's like a a screed. Mm -hmm. You know, where it's sand and a bit of cement. Yeah. So you would you would do it a similar way. Uh, there's different people have different techniques of pour, and you call it pouring the floor. Mm -hmm. They have different techniques. Um, you can set depending on what your base is. If you're on a plywood floor, like people that can put like a little plywood form or some uh, pipes to get even uh, height on both sides of your trowel. And then you bring in the material and then you, you just ride your trowel on these guides, make it all nice and pretty. You take those pipes off and you need to crumble the mix onto itself because you don't want to have a, a crack line it, as if you just like fill it up it'll be probably crack in there so you kind of make it all uneven again 
patch it all up. Or um, me, what I'm thinking of doing is more borrowed from the concrete. Is like I want to, uh, I'm gonna have my edges defined, snap a line on all my perimeters, and I'm gonna bring in my mix and bring it to that line because I know my floor is a bit uneven from across the room too. And do about just one trial width all the way on the perimeter of the room. And then I can start filling in the middle. And uh, you'll see over there I have an eight foot screed. Uh, so I'm gonna, if the room is less than eight feet, I'm a bit, well, I have to go at an angle. Or you can put a board in the middle too, or I could do a strip down the middle, like an earthen floor down the middle, at that proper elevation, and check side to side with a board or a straight edge. You can use the BB stick on the uh, laser too, and just set, like, set different areas at whatever the yeah. street is, and set that, trowel it down, and then you got it. Yeah, you have, you have your, and, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. You rake in between. And, yeah, well, you have your, 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 I call it the blobs, like you set your blobs for yeah. your elevation and then you just fill in between your blobs and you, and they'll, they'll start to set a little bit, but with an earthen floor it takes, it takes days to weeks for the, for it to set. And it's, uh, that's, that's what I'm told and I can, cause I've done a, I've re-leveled the floor too using a screen method, like just sand and cement. That's heavy work, that's heavy work, like each bucket is, and it's wet too, so it's very, very heavy. You need a lot of people, you, you need someone to keep mixing con continuously, while someone is installing all the time and people are just running back and forth with the material. And then, uh, 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 um, it's, it's exactly like a concrete floor in a sense, like you'll, you'll pour it, you walk yourself out of the room, and you finish it and you walk out of the room, you know, but, and then uh, you get your styrofoam shoes or, uh, and blocks and then you go back uh, and you put your styrofoam yeah. and then you, you burnish it and you polish the heck out of it and you do your corners and you polish it you and then um, you let it sit like that and depending on your mix and same, same with uh, as I was mentioning, the water ratio in all the different recipes, like why is it, isn't it really like talked about or listed? Is because like your your drying time is going to factor. It is going to depend on the temperature that day. If you got fans, uh, are you in elevation or at sea level? And like a lot of factors come in and play too. So it's not like oh, is it going to take two days to dry or maybe maybe not? <laughs> if it's raining outside, it's going to take longer. You, did you add a pigment that's possible and that'll accelerate things too, that'll yeah. cause drying time, it brings up exothermic reaction temperatures, all that. Right, right. But the, okay. If you put, if it's, if there's more water, it's easier to spread and mm -hmm. it's easier to finish. Yeah. It'll take longer to dry, but yeah. if you try to work with material that's too dry, it's very labor intensive, you have to use a lot of pressure, it goes slower. Yeah. yeah. And so, um... There's, there's two ways, like uh, Sukita in her book, and it's, it's the tr traditional way, so you pour the floor, and I think it's three parts sand, one part clay, and some straw, about 15% of the combined in volume of straw, that's the, the, the proportion that she, she knows works well for her all the time. And you pour it a uh, minimum three quarters of an inch thick, minimum, if you have radi radiant floor heating and you're doing it, you gotta have a, an, an inch over your pipes. So potentially like an inch and a half thick up for your floor. Um, and then you go back with a drying oil. Typically is uh, linseed oil. What else? There's also walnut oil, ant oil, tongue oil, peanut, I think, sunflower oil, but some kind of oil. And you go back and you you don't wash it, but you spread you spread the oil on your floor, and for that to soak in to your floor, and about like it's gonna go about half an inch deep. Oh, you put a citrus solvent, you dilute the oil a little bit so that it penetrates deeper, that's right. And then, uh, 
you do a couple of coats of that, the putting the oil, oiling the floor. And then she talks about like it takes like minimum two weeks of dry time before you can go and walk on the floor afterwards. Because I guess the oil is like probably a bit sticky and if you were to go on there you'd leave like finger, uh, prints, uh, footprints. Um, uh, uh, uh. With Chris Magwood at the Endeavor Center, we mixed in the oil during the mixing process. So it was a one step process. But I, ne I never seen that anywhere else or read about it. And but I've done it, so I can't deny it. Like it's like first-hand experience. Like we mixed everything, put it in the mixer, mm -hmm. and then it's like the one one-time application. You don't have to go back. You put your fans, like let it dry. Was it easier to finish that way, or? You probably act like uh, we didn't get to like finish it per se in the context of my course because it was on the last day. It's the last thing. It, then you can't go in the building for two right. weeks. So. On the last or before last day, we did the, the floor, and then we just like finish touch ups on the outside of the building kind of thing. We so never go back in. As you're going, like, would you screen and then and then trowel it over as you're going out of the building? It would be all the steps are happening right then and there, like you're replacing well, and finishing. But because you're working out. with with the clay too, like even you finish as, as smooth as you can but it's yeah. going to change as it dries a little bit so you go back and you yeah. until you get the finish you want yeah, yeah. with a nice uh, nice travel yeah. uh, you can put beeswax to increase the uh, water resistance and washability of the floor but the oil is what happens is like you were talking about the lime crystals like the yeah. they call it a polymer chain so the oil as it dries creates those polymer chains which binds and gives it a hard surface. And I have a friend in the cusp who I've convinced to do an earthen floor into his little cabin. And so he put the perlite for his insulation. And then he did the, the pour and I, I, was, I, was, I wasn't there at that time. But uh, we visited him in the, in the winter and he, the floor look, looks good. Is that Dave? Dave yeah. Dixon? Dave, um, Dave Dixon. He's up, uh, was it? Uh, the Fox Club. Is it Fox Club Road area? Up, up there, anyway. Uh, Crescent Bay area, yep. up there. But he, he told us a story. He was working, like doing other tasks in his house, and he was in his uh, A frame ladder. He dropped a screwdriver. He's like, oh no. And he went down, he's like, nothing. <laughs> there was nothing happened to the floor. But you can repair your floor. Is that the beauty of it? As if you ever ding it or crack it, if, if there's cracking, you can go back and get it wet and uh, push more material into the crack and push hard and compress it and then oil it again so you can repair it. With the, uh, the earthen floors, the, the, the uh, challenges will be the outside corners of rooms or if you have a post in the middle of a room then you have four outside corners. And from the wood movement, which expands and shrinks, and crack, yeah. there's potential for cracking. So you would put a little piece of a little rubber membrane around the base to prevent that from happening. So it acts like a, as a bumper, instead or like same in so concrete. You got yeah, in cuts, concrete yeah. you get your relief cuts or you the, the Donna Connor. Yeah, the, yeah, you could use that stuff. Right, I, I don't but, like that stuff. But yeah, the sill gasket works really good. Yeah, it's easy to tape up, and I so, find the Donna Connor soaks in a lot of moisture. Yeah, I wouldn't really use that, but the idea is the same that it, it absorbs the movement of the concrete. Yeah, and the sliding yeah. between the two. We even seen corrugated uh, plastic. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we could. What do you think? Are these the ones that you It might be nice to bring everything in here then because I want to. for com comparing the different. It's a lot of it, a lot of yeah, it's, a, it's a bit hot in here though. Yeah, um, yeah. It, yeah it's going to be hotter. There's wind out there. Yeah. Okay. Now, if Erica said under one of the By the way, stands. guys, <laughs> if there's anyone who's size 12 ish who's interested in awesome work boots, I have these that you can try on. They're Japanese tabbies, and they are they have steel toe and they have thunder resistant soles. Why don't you but use they're them? A size I bought them for him, but for they're me, too big. Trying to find someone who's will fit in there before sending them back to Japan. <laughs> deciding where I get what you Oh, they almost fit you. You just got to grow your feet a little more. Well, I, 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 I sure fit my for a, Very close. For a, that, which actually I like too. Yeah, and this it's very similar to what we have. <laughs> yeah. And then in the rooms where we did a couple things like on in the one bedroom we tried mixing mica powder into the top slip. Okay. They painted mica and... We well, don't have access to bad clay, but there is clay in your area for sure. So ask around, like people that have excavators and they'll know where there's clay around here for sure. Um, might even, yeah. So that's what Joy and I, we stumbled upon a guy who was excavating around the shop and he says, oh, I got clay around here, I know. So then that was in the fall. And so when he actually started doing the work, we were picking up the clay and it was like huge chunks too, because you had a big, big machine, but it was contaminated for say, like it's full of little rocks, pebbles, whatever like sticks to the clay, right? Like when like, uh, yeah, whatever gets in contact with the clay on the top and bottom layers, it kind of sticks with it. The inside is pretty clean, really, it's, it's quite nice. So we ended up with a lot of chunks like that, this size and even bigger, like this is like a broken off chunk of uh, just straight, straight clay. Uh, Can I pass it around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's amazing how pure it is actually. Yeah, yeah. Can I get a chunk off it? And then actually <laughs> when it came off the ground, it was still moisture in it. You could have like used it for pottery, like we were making balls out of it and making pancakes and it was like super, super cool. Um, even the, the yeah. backhoe operator was like, how come I can't put this down? Like, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> you just had a kick out of it. And, um, and so I know of two ways to process the clay that you would collect. There's a dry method and then there's a wet method. The dry method is really dusty, mm -hmm. but it's a bit faster. Mm. Uh, so what we did, we got these chunks and you can hammer it into smaller chunks and make yeah. a fine powder out of it. For me? Yeah. Oh. You make a, you make <laughs> a fine powder out of it. I've seen lots of clay. I ended things. up uh, renting a plate compactor and going over it. Like I would put a tarp in the driveway and we put all the clay and we let it dry in the sun. Then I went over it with a plate compactor and I crushed it. Um, then, then you can sift that, the powder. So you have your screen that you your, you build a frame and you attach a screen to it and you take your shovel, sure. throw it through the screen. Whatever makes it through the screen is fine enough <coughs> to be used. You gotta have the right screen, of course. And then whatever falls off at the bottom goes up in the reject pile and you do whatever you need for your project like that. I ended up trying to be more creative. Uh, I ended up building a frame for that plate packer at 15 degree angle with a chute at the front. And all I had to do is like scoop the material into the chute and it would vibrate itself, go under the compactor and then get screened behind and it fall down. It was very, very, very dusty, annoyingly dusty and it was loud and i was breathing exhaust fumes from a two-stroke engine like all afternoon and i was, was nauseous and it wasn't great 
Then the compactor crapped out on us. We're going to start again. Maybe too much dust got in the in it. And we realized we can drive the car over it. So Joy ended up just driving <laughs> over the clay. It works so fast. And it makes such a fine dust too. And then all we had to do is screen it. So there's still like a couple of steps to doing that. But if you get access to like pure clay or just about pure clay, that would be one way to process it. The wet method, which I've seen more like for people that do pottery, they find a heavy clay soil. So you want to remove all the rocks and pebbles and aggregate out of it because you can't, you can't bake that. So you, you would take your blob of clay and put it in water, like a lot of water. And you just stir it up, mix it up, and you make like a big slurry out of it. And once you have that slurry, you go, you you can run it through a mesh. Like I got like a even um, for a paint uh, mm. paint mesh for that. And so you dump you dump your slurry in there. Then all the rocks and aggregates they stay in there. And it should, yeah, I mean, it has to be like thin enough that the clay won't stay in that. Like it's a very fine mash, but you'll, and then you're left with a pretty, pretty fine slurry in there. And so you get a, a, a nice tight knit pillowcase. Mm. And then you pour that. Oh no, sorry. Hey, that's the step I didn't do the first time I did it. Then you let, you need to let, let it settle. The water will... So then all the clay will be at the bottom and the water on top. Mm. Then you scoop up or drain the excess water as much as you can without getting rid of your clay. Because if you don't do that and if you just put everything with the water in the pillowcase, it's going to take a week. Because there's so, there's so much water and the clay seals it up and it doesn't have anywhere to go. So I think I got more water through evaporation than actually like <laughs> going through that. So, oh, so then you would put your clay in the pillowcase and then you hang it on a tree, under a ladder, you hang it somewhere. Well, it'll take a couple days for it to be, like the water to be through. And then you're left with like the original clay out of the soil, like it's like it's malleable, like still, it's still damp and wet. If you let it like dry again, it'll, it'll go back to this. But it'll be without all the rocks and pebbles into it, mm. which then you can crush and and make a fine powder out of it without having to sift it again. And you could, I would say, like if you're you have a need for clay, like start doing it once in a while. Because if you try to do it all in one weekend, you're gonna burn yourself out, and it's not fun anymore. Mm. It's like like a lot of those harvesting and processing steps. It's fun for about two hours. You get a kick like on the third hour maybe. And, but if you're doing it like Joy and I, just the two of us doing like all of that. And it's a lot of work. And it's, we're burning ourselves up the, on, the, on most weekends. Um, what I do when I'm processing my own clay is I go through that stage of letting it settle yeah. and pouring off the um, excess water. The excess water. And then I just pour it onto a porous surface. I have plaster slabs that I've made up, but I find also plywood, um, okay. all kinds of things like that. Um, you can just pour it on and it it evaporates because you don't So if you have a thin layer, it'll evaporate faster. And then you just peel it off. Okay. I used to just use, yeah, it was like plywood table with uh, canvas. Yeah, I, and yeah. that's what I Couple do too. Is I've got yeah, canvas. Yeah, yeah. Or I use... Um, old pottery bowls that I've made that didn't work out for whatever reason. They're un, unglazed and pour it in there and it's literally like an hour later you can peel it out. And okay. It's actually okay. faster than Yeah, fabric. this, this I found is kind of slow. I know it works. Yeah. But I felt, and then like how many pillowcases can I hang around my, my yeah. place and it's very limited. Mm -hmm. That's why we chose the, the, the dry method because we could do Right. like a full cubic yard in, in, in half a, in a day. One uh, other thing just from the potter in me yeah. is that if you want to wet clay like that, if it is 100% dry, it will dissolve in water quite quickly. If it has a little bit of moisture in it, it'll sit there like a rock in the bottom of your bucket and never ever dissolve. Okay. Mm. okay. So mm. 
like you want to make sure that your your clay is fully dry, dry before you put it in water okay i don't know why but but it it's like almost water resistant when it's damp mm. okay interesting yeah mm. see clay and i'm sure different clays are have different yeah if you've got more aggregate in there more any kind of sand it'll yeah. absorb water way better but pure clay will not absorb water mm. okay. if it's damp mm. and then um so if you want to use site soil or determine like the clay content of your soil you would dig out a couple test test holes at uh, different depths also and an easy way to determine it's not, it's scientific in a way but it's so you put your soil in the mason jar you add some water and you just shake it and you shake it all and then you let it I did that while well, we, sh we we moved it a bit too but I did that this morning mm. and so the the sand and rocks and sediment like well they will like get at the bottom I mean mm. and that's a different color then I have the clay layer on top and then I might have a bit of silt depending on your soil this is actually I did that I wanted to do about a 50 50 mix out of my like raw ingredients to see how that would show and depending on the you know if if I let it sit at an angle it is just level and it'll look off side to side but then you would determine the ratio in this space what's the ratio or the percentage of sand and the percentage of clay mm. and so this is this looks almost like almost 50 50 it's it's not far from that let's say 60 40 so if I have a recipe or like I want to do cob or a plaster that requires a 50-50 mix, mm -hmm. I got it right there in my soil. Mm. If I need a two for one recipe, then I can add some sand to it. If I had like low clay, then I can just add clay to my soil. So you don't need to buy like all of the ingredients or process all of it like I'm, I've been doing. You, if you find a, a good uh, source, you can just start from that. Ultimately, there might be some aggregate into it also that you'll need to maybe sort out or sift. Um, and as far as aggregate goes, you can tolerate up to the size of just under the thickness of the coat that you're about to put. So if you're gonna put a 5 8 thick coat of plaster or mud, you can have like up to half inch size aggregate it's a bit big but like so that it doesn't show through that layer you, you can have rocks sticking out so it's going to be like just under that uh if you go with a deeper a deeper coat you could have like bigger aggregate and it would be tolerable um in the biz in the in the excavation business like what what i found for the base coat is what's called coarse sand so it's sand with some small pebbles into it uh, and then uh, the the source that i ended up finding out i sifted it because there was like a few bigger chunks in it but it was like the perfect size pebbles and rocks for making concrete so i had i was left with a i had my sand and all sifted the size i wanted and i had like aggregate for doing other things after so uh, that worked out okay and then before you start to plaster your entire house with whatever you found you, <laughs> I can't stress enough you gotta do some tests yeah. you gotta figure out if it's gonna work how it's gonna behave what recipe is gonna work for the circumstances and uh, you figure out your ratios so once I've had that, oh, and you want to try to replicate, like your tests, you want to try to replicate your, your real life conditions as much as possible. So if you're going to put it uh, a half inch coat on hempcrete, over hempcrete, then like do a test of a half inch thickness over hempcrete somewhere, find a corner in your house or in your wall or find a hempcrete block that you add and like put a half inch thick and see how it, how it goes. Uh, work around is I made you can make these frames with the thickness frame that you need your coat to be in this instance I think it's half inch and so I've done these little frames 
And then I try different recipes. And uh, you butter up in the frame, you fill it up, you trowel it in, you see how it's working. Is like, is it is cons consistency okay? And how is it gonna behave? And so, and this was with the fine sand. And so, I can, I don't know if you, I can pass it around. You can see like it, it cracked, like it cracked. It failed miserably, but I think some of it was during the transport yesterday too, because I don't remember it's as many cracks. <laughs> But it shrunk a lot. There, there wasn't a gap around the frame when I did that. It was like completely full. So the this kind of clay with this kind of mix, it shrunk quite a lot. And then it cracked. And this one was one part clay, one part sand. Mm. And you label it too, so you can like get, get back to it and see what it's like. And it was with the fine sand. And this is this, this also feels heavier. It's so one, one part clay, two parts sand. Mm. And it's the same size frame. It, it also shrunk a bit, but there's less, there's a bit less cracking in it. And then I did, what's that one? One part clay, one part sand with some straw fiber in it. Mm. Wow, what a difference. So it also shrunk. It's the same clay, so I think that's what happens. Like that clay just swells a lot when it's wet and okay. And then there's I was like, wow, I like I like I like this finish a lot. Yeah. And then I tried one part clay, two parts sand. And I got little hairline cracks into it. This is not critical because when you put the next layer of plaster, the finished plaster, which would be like just an eighth thick, this is a half inch thick, so it, there was a little more movement. Like the, the thinner your, the thicker your coat, the more the, the movement will uh, it'll be amplified. So a little airline cracks like that, if you got that on your wall, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker, it's not like the end of the world. If you wanted, you could come and repair them, or you can just plaster yeah. over it. That shouldn't be shouldn't be much of an issue. And so I would advise too, like that, that's where I stopped in my process. I was happy with with that ratio, so I didn't go beyond making more tests. Hence, I have like empty frames. Uh, but ultimately, if you decide to use site soil, or you're not sure. You could do also a test, just straight clay. Just do a frame, just just see how the clay behaves and if it's gonna crack or uh, some clays like they flake, you know, like uh, like the skin, it just flakes and cracks everywhere. Uh, and then do the different ratios. They could be, uh, you know, try like one sand, one clay, one sand, one clay and some fiber. And then two sand, one clay, and I go all the two sand, one clay, one some fiber, and then three sand, one clay, three sand, one, and some fiber. I don't think you know you need to go beyond that. But you can also do like half, so you can do like one and a half sand to one clay, or two and a half sand to. So you, you can work your you you gotta figure out the ratios. But if you do like a one to one, two to one, three to one. You'll be in the ballpark of getting something or figuring, being able to determine what's going to work. Then you can for sure like tweak it, refine it, refine it more and more and more. Would you ever do a scratch coat without fiber in it? Uh, uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine why somebody would do that. For one but, thing, you need more No, clay. but like a, for your finished coat, you'll get like a thinner, you'll yeah. get a thinner coat, but I, I wanted to, you know, I know what you're saying. Like you want the, you to want prevent the cracking of the next layer and everything. Yeah, you want the fiber yeah. in it. Um, I will say though, I'm quite, pl I'm quite happy with the way the hempcrete is holding the, fi the, the plaster. And also we did the hempcrete and we starting plastering six months later. So all the movement of the hempcrete has happened already. That it's an old house. So all the movement of the house has happened already. Can I have one more? Um, if you're plastering over straw bales, which has a lot more give to it, Is that the tiny one? you're gonna sure. wanna do what they call a slip coat. 
So you're just gonna be clay, clay and water mixed into a milkshake-like consistency that you're gonna spray over the entire wall. And that's gonna, that's gonna shoot clay on all the little straw fibers and all the little nooks and crannies in the straw. Which then when you come behind with your base coat, it's gonna stick to it because there's two methods of adhesion. There's a chemical bond and there's a mechanical bond. So clay on clay, that's a, that's a chemical bond. If you get wet clay with wet clay, you mix them, you mash them together and you get one ball and you can't differentiate where's the first ball, where's the other, like they, they're bonded. I have a question, sorry. Yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I was just wondering like, in this area, do we, like, I'm sorry, this might sound like a really dumb question, but like where, where would we get clay? Burton. There's Bur lots of clay and burton, burton? Down on, the, on the lake. Oh, okay, so just along the lake? So you just kind of go wherever you can find it? Well, he was saying if you talk to any excavators, like, there's always... They clay. know. People they, that yeah. do rope, that build roads, oh, driveways... Yeah. Anywhere, it's just veins. They come in veins. Like right, oh. Under, there's some at six, the, at nine mile, we found a big clay bank. Nixon anywhere road, under the water, because what happens is, like, under the water, if, like, lakes, it's like, it gets really hard and then it packs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. There's clay everywhere. There's clay everywhere. Everywhere for sure. And oh, okay. sometimes you'll even find it in your own soil. Like yeah. if you right. if you're lucky you have it right on site. Yeah, do you think yeah. Oh. a lot of people when they're digging yeah. like There's the hole for their foundation, they'll yeah. put the clay is, aside and then they'll use that. You'll that see it on creeks too. Yeah. Yeah. Like creeks yeah. that yeah. road the bank got a new driveway. Like when we went up Little Wilson, I bet we could have found a huge operator mentioned all Like just a long creek cuz it takes up the side of the bank. And you'll see layers upon layers yeah. of how the sediment was okay. deposited. Yeah. Sorry. Just, it's okay. I was like, oh, and a lot of times wondering. people want to get rid of clay too. So. Yeah. Yeah, like well, this unstable. guy that we, yeah. it was it was a win-win because he needed to get rid of it because it was affecting his water drainage. Yeah. So we're like, yes, please. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's so great. But so yeah, so the straw, so plastering on straw bale, you can, you do your slip coat and then so you're kind of getting clay, a thin layer of clay all over the straw fibers so that when you come with your, your plaster, like your, your, your stuff, it'll start to stick already. Like it's an easier bond because like there's a chemical bond happening. There's little nooks and crannies through the whole entire straw which will add some mechanical grip to it. But this is where I, I find that the hempcrete, like it's, it's so good because like look at all the little nooks and crannies when, it, when you're pushing plaster in there, it's just going to fill this hole, fill this hole, fill everywhere and it's going to stick to it. Cool. Plus um, the lime will s suck any moisture. Yeah, you could do a lime plaster, which is what most people do over the hempcrete, but you can, you can make your own recipe. Like people say, uh, even... Um, you can have a, 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 a clay-based plaster and you add a bit of lime to it to get the chemical bond of lime to lime yeah. to your clay plaster. But I think even that, you know, being that you're, you're plastering over lime, lime is moisture hungry, it's going to draw the clay in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, yeah. Uh, I think just, yeah, I don't think you'd even need the lime to lime, I think it would... Uh, because yeah, it's it's a property that potters use to suck moisture out of okay. clay. Okay, okay. And then you can be creative with like your your additives. You can add to your mix. So for us, we're adding a wheat paste, which is just flour, just flour and water. And, borax. Um, and, oh, and, we, and we put a bit of borax to it so that because there's a potential for mold to happen because of the flour so you put a bit of borax but it's a wheat paste and uh, you know when you've done pa paper mache you just like wheat uh, flour water and you like soak your paper in there and you shape it and it's it hardens and so it adds like a property to the plaster which it, it sticks a little bit more and a bit more I would say make it doesn't make it more gel like but there's some good properties that and I didn't try 
I didn't have any wheat paste on any, any of these samples either. So it, I think it helps. Uh, we're using it in all of our batches so far. Um, yeah. Oh, and also as you're going over the wall uh, or the, the building, you can tweak your ratios a little bit depending on your needs. So we're seeing it in Japan, like around the borders of the, the walls, they use a lightly sandier mix than the middle of the wall. And when you're going, like I was, when I was like working um, inside the window, well, like vertical, like, it's like I need something that sticks more than my current mix. So I use whatever mix on the rest of the wall. Then my next batch, I tweak, I put a bit more clay or a bit more sand. And then like till it sticks there. So you can tweak it as you go along the wall. You don't need to have the same recipe forever and be set in that. Other additives that people add to <laughs> to uh, clay plaster or like, like horse manure and cow manure. And what it does is there's like miniature softened fibers in the manure, which adds some strength to your plaster. Uh, I hear you only want to work with dry manure so that it cr it breaks uh, and distributes evenly. And there's also enzymes in the manure. So I, I'm, I was reading horse manure makes it more water resistant, mm. but cow manure makes it a harder finish. And so <laughs> more stuff to experiment with there. In, uh, in, in Japan, they use uh, some seaweed that they add to their plaster, which makes it really jelly-like. jelly, jelly -like. And It spreads, that's really nice. The amount of water that you're gonna wanna add will depend on the consistency that you wanna have. It's kinda like with drywall mud. It's gonna spread easy. It's more like a thick mayonnaise. Peanut butter is harder to spread, especially when you're starting to work with your trowel. You gotta put more force behind it and push it in. So if it's too thick, it, you're, you're working harder. You can still get the same result, but it's more work on you. Uh, but if it's too wet, it's gonna be runny. It's gonna like crumble or stuff down the wall or just peel off. So there's a, a fine balance to be found there. Um, and then, okay. Oh, the cattail, the cattail is here. The cattail fluff. Uh, that was a good example. It's still on the stick, so that's a kind of fiber that you can add to your finished plaster. Oh, cool. Because it'll, you, won't, you won't see it in the end, like it's like straw and it's poking out. It was like flattened out and it's just like it disappears inside your inside your wall. Um, there's also like artificial fibers and metal fibers and plastic fibers. Apparently plastic you would you want to avoid because it doesn't bend down like when you want to put it. It, set, it finds its place and it just stays there, stays there so yeah. it'll stick out. Oh, the cattail's flying away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. trying, trying to do a no. finish no. with <laughs> We're spreading the, the seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Leave big scratches. So yeah. for a first good fun. finish coat, right like now. fiber, Just if you're troweling it anyway, it'll... Don't do it. It'll be irritating. Don't do it. It can be done. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You can, like, heal the scratches. What is it? Cat the tail. first time you do a trowel What's is cat that because I've done it's it before. It's so nice. Yeah. It turns into yeah. flesh. Some, but then when you do your burnishing, it heals. Yeah. Whereas concrete doesn't. Yeah. It does. It, it just, yeah. It just like, there's a stage where it's really frustrating, where it does ball up. And the surface still isn't quite hard enough to really, you know, oh, polish thank over. You. But right. <laughs> eventually it works. So, uh, and Sorry. in one of the books on plaster recipes, um, and uh, actually like the lady, uh, one of the great clay artists too, and uh, she does straw bale homes. Uh, her name escapes me, I have her book over there. Um, she adds grass clippings to her plaster. 
I've seen another person add like cottage cheese and they call it the, the fat plaster. Oh my gosh. Jesus. And so that's, that's a expensive. lot of the waste of cottage cheese. Yeah, I love cottage cheese. <laughs> so um, so there's a lot of different additives or like anyway, like you know what you can put in. There's there's things that you know works and like you kinda of wanna probably wanna to stick to it once you find something that works because you want quality consistent results, but when you're experimenting, like go outside the think, think outside the box. Um, and then, oh, you only want to apply plaster on a hard surface. Same as with drywall, if you're putting it on like a delaminated, like a, a soft. How do you explain that? If there's a soft spot in your wall that it's gonna peel off or flake off, just chuck it off and like because otherwise it's like trying if you imagine putting plaster on a balloon it works but then when the balloon deflates there's nothing behind it and it's just like gonna crumble and crack so you can still plaster over like start like a star spray foam or something soft like that's behind your wall but if you go and press on that spot on the wall it's gonna crack and then fall off probably so always on a hard surface over your studs or wood members like plaster is not going to stick to it like it's a, plaster doesn't stick to a two by four very well or for very long so you can uh you have to put a mesh a mesh over it this is gutter guard gutter guard mesh do you put a mesh over straw bale too when you plaster it uh you can but uh, it should be sufficient that you don't need to. Oh, you just plaster right on the straw bale. But wherever you have a, and uh, what they were doing, like wherever there's a stud, uh, we're running strings in front of the stud, weaving a string, and then you're stuffing straw uh, on front of the stud. So when you're putting your cob, like it's just like an all on straw. And uh, on my window box, my window uh, cavities, I'm, I'm putting this kind of a mesh. And you want a mesh that's got some, some rigidity to it. Right. Uh, or chicken wire. I, I prefer to use plastic to uh, metal. So to metal um, in case it would rust and fail over time. Um, but like oh, everywhere I've got wood around my windows, which is like three sides of my windows, I've, I've stapled some of that mesh and I'm artificially creating mechanical grip for my plaster to stick to it. Oh, yeah. so, so you went down to some Marlin's cabin this morning, so if there was plywood there, you could put this mesh on it yeah. and plaster directly on that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's very common like people that do exterior stucco. Right. They put a similar matrix, but it's all metal. Right. And they, they, they right. cover the entire the building uh -huh. with the mesh. And then they put their stucco onto it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we actually use burlap over the studs. Burlap, I've heard of that too. I forget, there was something that... At least like part of it. It's kind of iffy about the burlap. I, I think it wasn't like a, a good enough adhesion depending on the the weaving of your burlap, yeah. that it was like maybe iffy. It didn't crack, it's been like 12 years or something, okay. it hasn't cracked. Okay, there's that. Uh, drywall, dr the regular drywall tape. Yes. The inch and seven eighths, oh, the inch and seven eighths drywall tape. I'm uh, just putting that over my studs everywhere. Uh, I'm stapling it too, so it does, it, it's, it's self adhesive, but so it, when you're Troweling it so it doesn't come off, and then like you got yeah, a big mess, actually. a big mess to clean. So wherever you're gonna have joints, or if you're plastering, uh, it's just like when you're doing drywall, you put some mesh between your panels to create that bond between, so it it doesn't crack in that area. So similarly with the plaster in your corners, or if you have like uh, over the wood, or um, you'll put some of that plaster and. This is uh, the top and bottom of my walls. It's good practice. So we're making like what's called uh, plaster stops. So I rip some strips of three inch uh, plywood and I'm putting some of that mesh at the bottom. 
And that's that ends up being the thickness of the plaster that I want to have. Right. So here I want to have a five eighths thick plaster. That would be the bottom of the of the wall. That, I'll put one at the bottom, one at the top. Uh -huh. On my exterior walls, I'm adding. Uh, it's called an air fin, so it's Tyvek. Again, it's directional, so that if the plaster shrinks, I still have an airtight wall because there's that air fin behind which oh, the air can't go through. Mm -hmm. That's and over the whole wall, the air fin? Uh, just at the top. Oh, just at the top. Just at the top where there's like potential for oh, drafts right, right. and infiltration. Mm -hmm. The rest of the wall, the plaster is making the air tightness. It's sealing the wall. And then I'm adding that mechanical grip at the top and bottom. Um, and that's going to, over, over to prevent like shrink. To prevent the shrinkage. Well, if you're plastering over plywood, then you're going over hemp. So you strap like in your yeah. Hemp. For me, okay. it's hemp or straw right. bale. Okay, That's right. you would do that also. So it goes like that in your wall, and then you come in and you plaster it. I took an extra step. Like I ended up like putting a really thin coat uh, at the bottom before putting that on, just to make like extra air tightness. Can I feel this? Yeah, for sure. No, I would actually say that that was a really wise step because the one thing that I noticed about our walls is that because of that stop, there was no plaster on that last little bit and you could feel, because of the circulation cold to hot, you could feel cold air dumping out of the bottom of the wall. Okay. So I ended up having to um, pound a thin strip of styrofoam in there to seal that gap huh. um, because there was they like had bet put between a, a the plaster and the, the plaster stop well they had put a they had put the stop and there was a little bit of a crack underneath of it yeah because I guess nobody was quite sure how thick the floor was going to be or whatever and it was dumping out because there was no plaster over that okay last little bit right it wasn't much but it was enough that you could feel it yeah and what was that extra step you said you did what was it? Well, he I, painted I, I, a, or put a thin coat of, of uh, mud over oh. Be before putting that on because then yeah, the air smart. can't dump out so of i'm the sealing air. it because airtight in straw bale you can't <laughs> You can consider them to be airtight it's wall exciting. assemblies. They become airtight once they're plastered over. Mm. Otherwise, like there's, depends on the difference yeah, of pressure inside that. to outside and whatever else, but air will find its way through the wall somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this prevents that from the air from creeping through at the top and the bottom of your wall. Even if your, your insulation is that thick with the temperature, yeah. it goes through? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. With, is that because it's... Cause it and it's mostly, track? it's mostly That's amazing. at the bottom. It depends on the packing too, like, you know, when it's, it'll be no, in the little no, corners and at the bottom or That's where it's coming there's from. details and then like, eventually like it find it, so it yeah. does like that. I ended up, uh, and my, my yeah, hempcrete shrunk a little bit too in some walls, mm -hmm. and I could feel it at the top. Woo! It was so cold in our house that I was like, I gotta do something. I spray foamed at the, the, the hairline at the top until we get to the plastering. So I'm gonna have to scratch the, that off before we move on with putting the plaster stops and all that, but we, we didn't have any heat in the house, so I gotta do something. But I, oh, it's, cool. I'll have to undo it. That hemcrete, we saw so much seeds in there too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah. seeds are not ideal either because. Could you get hemcrete without seeds? Um, some of some of it had less seeds in it. Yeah, the, each batch was a bit different. Yeah. And different lengths of fibers too, and uh, Wow. We yeah. had like 14 yard bags that we all got from the same place, but some of them, I don't know, they had they seemed to be slightly different. Yeah. But yeah, the, the seeds ha have a potential to mold. Right. So when, during the drying process, they got a little fuzzy. It was fine in the end. Um, mice also like to eat them. Why, why is it white like that? Is that the lime? The lime, the yeah. Lime, yeah. Okay. That is so cool. Yeah. It yeah. feels really same strong. Like this, right? yeah. this, is, uh, this is wood shredded uh, pallets. Mm -hmm. Recycled wood pallets, hardwood pallets, with a bit of cement. Wow. 
And then they cast it into blocks. They let it cure for 28 days. And they put the rock wall insert into it. And so it's an ICF block for making concrete. Well, you can make wall systems with it. Wow, that's But it, cool. it uses, I think, like 25% less concrete than a styrofoam uh, ICF block. What is it rated in the R value? Depends on the thickness of the block, but it has like really good R value, which I forget right now. It looks like it would. And then, an air gap. and then when you're putting your walls together, uh, they are your forms. You can screw anywhere into it. Wow. Versus styrofoam, you gotta find a little, like, little insert yeah. where they. But this, you can screw everywhere into it. This is also fireproof, and it's a perfect substrate for doing stucco right over it. You wouldn't need to put the mesh all over the place. You can just stucco right over it. And so, uh, yeah, there's a company in Ontario, and the other one is from in somewhere in Oregon. I ended up getting a block from each company for, for showcasing. Uh, yeah, that is great. Like, That's really cool. So instead of ICF, so cool. they do that? Uh, yeah, well, it's also called an ICF. It's not a styrofoam ICF. ICF stands for insulated concrete form. Mm -hmm. So it is also that. However, the transport, because they're pretty heavy, it's cost prohibitive in our area. Right, that makes sense. Uh, so, because otherwise, cost-wise, it's the same as the styrofoam, but then you, you gotta factor in the freight, and then like, it's just like... Especially so, now with gas. It's not, it's not yeah. worth it anymore. So insane, it's just like, puts everything out Cheaper of the to chop Can we in. make that? Postal Can we Some, if like someone awesome. wanted to try it, oh, they ridiculous. could make it for sure. Is it just concrete so, and fire? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, why I like to show it too. If someone at that time pallets. and space, you know, they pallets? could they could make the those shredded like, pallets. Make yeah. that locally, no yeah. like a business. Run pallets or a wood chipper. Yeah. 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 Who's got a wood chipper? I brought wow. a wood chipper. You do. <laughs> <laughs> you need a big commercial wood chipper. Well, my buddy does, but it's yeah. It's yeah. Covered. I'd be worried about it. Uh, well, that's the best efficient way to heat is is pellets. You, you can't use that time. that cedar stuff from the mill, say in the cast, say like that that stuff is different. Well, they say this is hardwood. Hard yeah, that hardwood. So yeah. I don't know. Hardwood like Hardwood's oak neutral. and maple and like if you yeah. used like uh, poplar or ash or birch. But I think it's the way they compress it. Yeah. Uh, whereas like if you use softwood, cedar, whatever, it's going to be acidic and that'll react to the concrete. Right. Okay. Right, right, that makes sense. Like using right. shale as an aggregate, it's no good. Well, that's just an dissolves. Interesting. You would be pretty acidic as well. Well, and it's the way it's the way they compress it because they add moisture to it and then to like the perfect level and then they compress it so it's like, yeah. It's really yeah. like yeah. There's a, a there's a company in Alberta now. They make hemp hemp uh, block. They look similar to that, but they're uh, pressed hemp and lime. Yeah, hemp creed box, so, uh, and they make that, Babes but uh, they don't. They're understaffed, and they they, they don't have enough. They always uh, sell everything they make, so uh, otherwise I would have a demo block for that too. But they never have enough. Um, so lots of trowels and stuff, like different thicknesses, right? Like this is the hawk, where you would s scoop the plaster from your bucket, your your bin, whatever, you put that in there, and then you take your other travel, and then they can put it on the on your wall and whatever. Or like depending on the thickness and the density, then I walk around and I take it with my hands and I smear it on the wall, all right? Mm. But this is more of like the conventional hawk. In Japan, I use something more like what the painters use, mm. like a little handle on the back, and you That's hold it cool. like that. Mm. And so that's pretty like easy for anybody to make. make. I, I, I spent like 15 minutes making like all these wooden trowels and well, uh, half an hour, but just to try it. I'm not happy with this angle for my arm for say, but you know, I can tweak, tweak it easily. So you don't need to go and spend like 30, $40 for, for something that you can make yourself or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're just going to do it once or twice, then me, I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. So I'm investing on some, some nice equipment. I want to try different. Anyway, I'm, I'm super curious about it. Yeah, right? it makes so, sense. Um, and then, you know, I've made, I've made this one for free. 
But then I paid like twelve dollars for that one, mm. right? Before I knew about all uh, some of that, mm. but they'll give you the same finish, really. Uh, that's a, and that's this is wearing out like quite rapidly, actually. I think it's a Hi. cedar and it's just wearing out. And then uh, in Japan, a lot of their trowels they're pointed like that, so. Uh, get, into the corners. get in the corners so you get in the corners way easier that way and in, uh, in your windows too like little tight spaces like it, it, I'm geeking out on Japanese trowels right now <laughs> but they, know how to they have like they have like the mini mini like almost like a ring it's almost like a finger ring for like doing the little details and corners and trowels, all that. Yeah. Yeah. They're oh, they're so they're cool. on order right now. I don't have them here. <laughs> and then I thought like I'll make I'll make a jumbo like, <laughs> like but um, what happens too is over here. So so this isn't a trowel. That's a float. So it has a rounded bevel like underneath, and it's made out of magnesium, which is a different metal than the the steel. So water reacts differently to the contact of the magnesium than it does to steel and because of the rounded edges it's really it's re it's called a float because you just float over it you won't like push into it yeah it won't like hit the corner or leave like scratch marks and you can move a lot of material with it and you can do a you can just have one of those and do a pretty good job with it that's fine did you buy that one yeah while well, I was doing some concrete work too, so, and then, um, then and that's a Darby, so that's like a float on steroids, <laughs> All right? Quite quite a difference. But if if you want to end up with straight walls, you need to have a stronger, a straighter, longer plane of reference. Mm. So it's fine. You can use your hands and make it flat over your hand width. And then if you have a trowel like that, you'll make it flat over this area. And now I can make it flat over like a bigger area. And then you're going like jumbo. Like you, you put mm. a lot of material on your wall. This is when you're stuccoing? Stuccoing, yeah. Yeah, plastering, yeah. And then you come in and, and you, you move <laughs> and you check. And you'll that for sure there'll be some low spots. And if you have some high spots, you can move the material towards the low spot. Uh, if not, you gotta add some more on your wall and you can float it. I'm, I'm obsessing over like straight flat walls. And <laughs> getting it from all sorts of angles too, like yeah. that way, side, and 45. Yeah. <laughs> you want to move it all you look like directions. You experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it made what? a lot of stuff really flat. Yeah, <laughs> flat earth. And Flat earth. Yeah, <laughs> making making it flat Whoa, on the floor. What's that? Kind of wall. And then that's a, that's a screed. So that's more like for concrete work. But I wanted to try it because I really, like I said, I'm obsessing over straight flat walls. <laughs> but it's I also because of uh, my plaster stops. It, it oh drops my, my height by three inches, top and bottom. And I can put that right against the wall. I'm touching my wall, top and bottom, and I can see. If I'm high or if I'm low. Oh, you could use as a measurement. Yeah. yeah. And if like I was high enough everywhere, we can have like someone hold the top and the bottom and I go over the wall to really bring it flat. There's a rounded edge here, which is more like for like moving the material and like there's a square edge it's for cutting and uh, doing the finishing with the trowel. What the trowel ends up doing. What's that one called? A screed. And they have like 10 foot, 12 foot. That's uh, that's again like from the concrete, the uh, concrete business. That could be used for the foundation too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you have like phone. specialty trowels. Just good. And there's a corner trowel. That's like a regular cor drywall corner trowel. And so you just, you give it a bit of an angle, and you get your mm. corners uh, that way. That's a pool trowel. It's got like the radiuses, so when you're making something flat, you don't have those sharp corners. That if you don't have the right movement, that's gonna leave a streak when you're wondering it. And the the metal like 
the the tip is flexible, mm -hmm. which uh, this this isn't very flexible, and so it's also gonna follow the the contour of the existing plaster. It's gonna deviate. The the trowel is gonna go like this as you're going over the wall, but it's gonna flatten the high spots, mm -hmm. and you go over a couple times. So it's a more like if you want like a nice smooth flat finish. You want something with more flex. It doesn't have to be like a, a pool trowel like that. Um, Which trowel do you like the best? Your well, favorite, your favorite. I like them all. Like I, I'm, I'm stoked about this float actually. Like I, I, I really love the finish it gives. Then there's also, you can get into plastic trowels. Um, I'm not really liking that one because it's a bit too big, and I need to put a. For the finish coat, it's gonna be awesome. But uh, for um, for the early coats where it's like thicker, like it's more body, it's too big, and I don't have I I can't put enough force on it to spread the material. But uh, the plastic trowels are more used for burnishing. So when it's like almost like leather hard, like it's still you can still work it, but mm -hmm. it's not dry. Not but dry. it's then you come back and you polish it like it's called burnishing mm -hmm. and so because it's not metal you're not impacting you're not drawing water out of your other wall and you're not like getting cream on the surface or so that's why a lot of finishing trowels like the burnishing trowels are made out of plastic even uh stuff like that uh, more like that or smaller stuff are gonna have a plastic uh plastic face to it for the uh for the burnishing of it and then depending on the kind of finish that you want to have on your wall you could use even like a grout trowel it's a sponge it's a rubber sponge mm. and so that'd be interesting to see how it's going to react how it's going to push the fibers in your in your wall bring more sands up fines and you then sand your surface with that and then like some people like uh, you know like the the pro plasterers in the world then they can get the finish they want, like whether it's a slick, like uh, reflective uh, finish, or you can go back with uh, you, a wet sponge. And if you want more of like, uh, if you want to expose more of the the the, uh, the fibers in your wall, you can soak up this. Like have a go with a wet sponge and go over your wall, and you're gonna kind of remove the the surface of the wall and expose the fibers in your wall and that's another like interesting finish that uh, you could ex experiment with there's no uh, there's no ending there um, so cool. and then yeah, so oh and the last little it's tool so that uh, some people have seen already it's the it's the bucket wedge so uh, pretty easy to make did, you, did two. you make that one? I made that one, but I made it for a Rona bucket. That's when I realized that not all buckets are the same. <laughs> 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 because I put my Rona bucket on, uh, you know, I had like this piece was like flat. Do you want the Rona bucket? You, you know, I put it there. Do you have it? Well, mm -hmm. there's stuff in it, but it should it should sit lower on the Rona bucket than it does. Uh, see, like it sits nice and flush everywhere. And then you put your 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 weight, your feet on it, and when you're mixing with the big paddle mixer, oh, your bucket the bucket spin. doesn't oh. spin, and it doesn't cut the inside of your legs or splash oh. everywhere or oh. move. Nice. It's it's the bucket wedge. That is cool. So as opposed to like let's say you know like it was tight, but this this bucket it kind of fits, but it doesn't sit tight in there. Mm, but if I push hard enough, I can still wedge. Watch the bucket that when I'm and mixing, mixing it, mixing your... it doesn't it doesn't spin and go around. So I would say like everybody make yourself a bucket wedge. <laughs> That's like freaking lifesaver. Cool. Um, Did you see that Jaden bucket wedge? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna need one of those. Okay. <laughs> that is well, amazing. That's um, well I would like to try different uh, ratios of sand and clay with fiber and make little balls and then we can like see how that feels and this is like the hands-on part where i'm just going to give instructions and someone can just do the work for me that's why i take i take a rest <laughs> yeah we can bring the sand and the, the clay here and oh, sorry. 
take your finger apart and um, maybe we can do our, the, 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 the earthen floor mix, three parts sand, one part clay. See how that that looks. But you want you need water. I got two. I uh, got a bit of water there, yeah. And oh. then when the those buckets are so. empty, we can go fill them up. I can fill them. The water spouts like it. Yeah. I was gonna do a big fill. Okay. Well. You kids get nobody. Your, nobody. Kids, nobody get I'm just. Okay. Now. He's gonna get in. He wants to help. He just wants to help. Yeah. That's okay, huh? I know you didn't want to do it. I know you liked it. Okay, so we'll figure out. Uh, like you can measure it and then you can put it in. Yeah. We'll, we'll make it easy on us. We'll so just, what is that you're putting in right now? Well, let's just do a full. It looks like sand. 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 Okay. This is cool. So you've done this before. Oh, that's okay. So put put that in there. We'll put one. So I ordered those gauges. Get it in there, Indra. That's one Whoa. bucket of sand. You're not in. You gonna help? Mm -hmm. well, hold on. Right. Do it. Do it two two more times. Two more times. Yeah. What is he mixing? We'll see. Okay, you can fill that one with clay. One bucket of clay. Where's the clay? Right here. Did you make this clay? Yeah. Did you get any? Oh. Let go of that stuff. Yeah. 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 Did you put this? That's in the perfect. Yeah, put, put it in there. Like you've done here? this before. You put it in here. Yeah, Playing put it right in there. In this one? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, is that sure. the clay? Yeah, that's. So he's gonna put three sand. sand don't breathe in the dust. Don't breathe that floor. dust in. Earth and floor, yeah. This is exciting, right? Okay. Yeah, you came right at the perfect time. I know. Didn't come okay. Right. What I re what I forgot to. Uh... No, okay, doesn't. that's good. You can go sit down now for now. Thanks. He's gonna watch. He's you actually it. add like uh, most of the water first, hmm? otherwise it get clumps. <laughs> <clubs. laughs> <laughs> Can I put this? Just put it on the table. Here. Yeah. So what are these things that you made? Oh, this is for making. Those oh, are for the half inch uh, testers oh, okay. to get your ratio down, yeah. and then it dries, and then you see if it cracks. And then, oh, okay. and then you can adjust your mixture. Can Not like sure. If you want different, more fiber or more. Clay I haven't done the more. math on the amount of water for this mix yet, so we'll. Uh, We'll wing it. Oh yeah, sure. Beautiful. <laughs> I can't tell if that was <laughs> sarcasm. Or... Here comes the if drill. Not, we just add more and more stuff or less stuff and so we get something. Go do another side of those. Go do another hit. You wanna you wanna start someone someone can start Me. dropping this in the bucket while I'm it. spinning it. Pretty dry, so yeah, we'll add a bit more water. And like water, just like with cement, you go like little at a time because a lot makes a big difference. So you have to up there.
正常，也就是。Pretty wet. Oh, I did add too much just, water pretty quick. It sounds, it it sounds sandy. Like it's pretty sandy. Okay. But, uh, and, and then we can put a, let's put a handful of straw and a, yeah. a bit of sand in there. We don't need a lot, I don't think. Yeah. Okay, that's probably enough. So, uh, JK, what are you looking for in the consistency? Well, I don't want it to be too runny. There's a bit of a story okay. behind that. Like like I we need, started off like, with. And counting? And when I, when I pick it up and make a ball out of it, I'm going to be able to hold that ball upside down and it's going to stick to itself. Okay. It doesn't. It can't. So that's what you want. It can't fall that's, down. That's yeah, that's how you get good, yeah. good adhesion. Look at this really nice texture. I love that. Mixer for doing this because I got tired of the spinning bucket. And then, so then we take that powder. It's still a bit wet. Yeah. Yeah. And if I mix it like it's the screen, it's not really holding in my hand. Oh, so this is the stuff that's coming off. Of the I put a bit of just like this. just a bit of clay to it. The clay's behind me. Can I scoop it in? No, I am. Well, just wait. Just wait. When we got it, it was blue because it was so black. Yeah, I want to do that. Uh, not, not a lot. Just a pinch. Just like. a pinch. Oh. That's also like. Yeah, at home I ended up investing like in a mortar mixer. Yeah, kind of you know, like no, a bit more. Nice try. Like maybe what was that? Sure. Let's try that. We also have color pigments. You can. You don't need a lot. And I got an electric mortar mixer because I don't want the exhaust and the fumes, and that was a whole story yeah. in itself, too. But now I got the kick ass Kukum <laughs> oh, mortar yeah. mixer. So you can use this on the wall, this picture, too? Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't think we need more uh, straw into it. That's not going to work. But, no, but that's just a natural. That's, that's already changed the consistency. What about that much more straw? That's a bit soft still, but it's... What about this much straw? What about this? Sure, Strong. put it in. There you go. See, want... it's, it's kind of falling apart yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So you still need a bit more. I need a bit, a bit more. Uh, oh, no. Not sure. Do you want it like toothpaste, kind of? Or what kind of consistency? Okay, yeah, or like peanut butter. Peanut butter, that's good. <laughs> but toothpaste, sure, I'll go with. Toothpaste? Chunky or, or smooth yeah, peanut butter? <laughs> Which no. no chunks in that oh, okay. Which brand. Oh, come on, Chunky's the best. But it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's getting this better. Is, this is a bit wet. So some more clay. More okay. clay. Well, then hold on, if hold we put, on, guys. If we put too much clay, well, but maybe that clay we need a bit more. That's yeah. too much. Well, I'll try it. Can I dump it in? Mm -hmm. we put more. We can, it's easier to add water than to add the other can stuff. I put it in? Yeah. No, can you I always have to say. I'll pack. only do a teeny bit. I know you. It's gonna put a little pass through. Satisfaction. Oh, oh, that was just a little, nice. little sprinkle. Yeah, you That's guys what we are like so to see. helpful. They're like the okay. little, they're like oh, the assistant. I was going to say something. Yeah. That's okay. I didn't realize it was so fast.
it's a good sign. Welcome. Okay, no. well, we're getting there. Still a bit, but you know it's not. It's not falling. You know, like whip. It's a bit soft, but like whipped cream, you gotta lift it. Starting to get stay vertical. So what? A little more clay? No, no. We now. Or sand? Oh no. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it quick. But we're almost there. What does it say? A little cob. A little. Uh, I guess a cob mix. Like that would probably be good for an earthen floor. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have a nice little ball well, to, to play with and pass around. I don't want to try it. Yeah. 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 There's the point too, eh? Like it's nice to have fiber for the tensile strand, but the more fiber you have, the harder is it is sandy. to spread too. This is sandy. Yeah, it's pretty sandy, eh? This is sandy. Why do you why do you need it so sandy? Babe, you're missing the mix here. That's the mix for the floor. Sure, yeah, floor. wash your hands, yeah. Can I try picking up a little piece? Pick it up, pass it around. Is it good take consistency now? It's, start, it's starting to get there. Like for a floor, that would be good. I like try. For going up a wall, it's a bit runny. Right, okay. But, uh. I'm trying. Ooh, nice. The trick is if one of the kids could put his foot in and not pull it out. Looks cool now. <laughs> want to try? Uh, wow. no. I don't want to get my hands dirty it's right now. Well, thanks, try. though. Yeah, he'll You'll get, get like a false yeah. Even okay. it'll, it'll harden, but then. I'm not, I'm I not think it's there and then. Come on, give it to me. Give it to me. Throw it at Leo. Oh, oh right no, yeah, I'm not sure. Nice. Can can wash your hands. Oh, cool. Kaleo, could I see? This is for your floor, earthen floor. Yeah. yeah there you go. Thank so you. What, oh, cool. wow. What do you want to add awesome. to it? You want to add more straw to it or more clay? I would add more straw to it because I want to make <laughs> because I want to make because I want to try to make a cob little house. Yeah. Oh, there's so oh, much there's clay that I can feel it detoxing my head. Yeah, the clay does that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. Ooh, it feels you know, nice. Yeah. Yeah. People mm -hmm. used to eat, but now they found out it's something. Okay, okay. Right, put a put a handful of straw in there. That. that doesn't it's sound right. very tasty. It's pretty fun, actually. I really like. I got it when I was like it. Looks like you can have it. Well, don't eat it. Yeah. Hard work that wasn't that fun. You still buy this part of it. Really sandy. The alternative is you pay a lot of money. That could be fun. Yeah, they use it to eat. I don't I don't know if anybody would have any Yeah, that you wanna like it easy to work out Yeah. There's a lady across the street who's like a master yeah, cob builder. Right. She has two rear differentials. I don't know if anybody will understand this, but I don't know what it means. But they told me she took two rear differentials of a car and created a, 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 an automatic well, mixing for cob, eh? and it mixes the cob automatically. Oh. And it's two rear differentials yeah. put together. And, 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 and she lives right there on Red Mountain Road. Well, she, she used yeah. to live across the street. Okay. But she oh, sold yeah. the place. Okay. Oh, yeah. Paul and Coco that's sold like, a little like spot pretty, across yeah, the highway. Cool. Okay. And Can it's anybody now it's a guy that lives there now. And he, I would like so to man of the clay. Yeah, the she's house. still around somewhere. You, you can ask Paul. Roberto, yeah, Cindy. Roberto knows yeah, where she's at. I, I worked awesome. with Cindy on a house. Yeah, that's Is she Cindy. around still? We didn't have a, add she a lot of clay had, um, and more fiber to it. It's she built um, some she said you have mm -hmm. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no the ratio is still pretty yeah. pretty yeah. 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 Yeah.
ball, ball to play with yeah, here right now. Yeah, it is super fun. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't want to do it for me. Now can we, um, now can we put a, now, I'm, 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 now can I have a little ball? Here, now can I make a little ball and then can I put it aside? Now can we add something else and see what yeah, this happens? Was that the Jesse Oldham's house on Red Mountain? The yeah. Uh, no, we did that one on Tuesday and then we did a garage with Chad Hicks and Roseberry and then we did that in Why did you put straw in place? What is this straw in place? It's Dino's. It's Dino's place that they're building there. Cracking, yeah, that massive, like, like really crazy yeah, floor plan. It's like, I, it, all, I thought it was yeah. like four different yeah. buildings yeah. at yeah. first, yeah. but it's all joined with these little yeah. corridors yeah. that go in between. Yeah. Yeah. And, Super cool, hand hewn beams. Like it's a really nice spot. Yeah, the father that's building that. Yeah. I think he, he gave each of the kids a, a property up there. Yeah, yeah. What? Can you remember? Because Keith and Teresa have their house up there. Yeah, they're up further, like past Jose's driveway. Yeah. yeah. You've been working with Jim's on the. Ah, uh, no, we were doing oh, concrete. Yeah, okay. concrete okay. flat work. Another young kid in town bought that uh, little concrete, the, the business. He worked there for years. So he works with them. Do you have a new baby? Yeah, he does. Yeah, River. River. Yeah, what's his yeah. partner's name again? Jess. Jess, yeah, yeah. She's a super nice person. Yeah, yeah, she did. She came and did a Waldorf for Andrew when he was there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she had a son yeah. before, so now they got two kids. Two kids. Right. Just bought a house. Okay. Uh, Brian? Okay. Brian? No, 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 he's up at Jose's now oh, in Roseberry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they bought a house so <laughs> river and then a trailer. It needs a ton of work. You know, Gary and Laura Lee Brecky? It's their old place. Oh, okay. like, no, yeah, double that? wide Acto so trailer. It needs a ton of water. Water. Is that, water. It is in rough shape. Yeah. Right off of there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, well, I think Riverwood too, if there was the money to just like, you know, dump whatever $500 a square foot into a new home now. Right. Pretty much. Like, any, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Why did the math and say a young couple bought a place for 350 or 400? They're looking at that's why I'm like cutting all my own trees, milling all the timbers. You got a mill up there? Every, the yeah. guys Everybody's got a mill. I don't need one. Tim's got one. Tim's got one, yeah. So I'll just I'll work with Tim and then I can do my stuff and help him with his. Tim just works for himself. Yeah, he was much of the worm you're able to squeeze. You got one, yeah. Before yeah, so oh, it's like, like that's another like, task for, there's like, things the that I'd like to have, the, the but then I'm like, oh, well, if I have these other things or if I have skills, yeah, then I can sure. trade yeah, for them. Yeah. Time. Oh, that's a with no, like if you if that was good of him to bought his, yeah. bought his own property uh -huh. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice spot. Yeah. Yeah. He loved yeah, this portion of it. A lot. A lot. Oh, look at this. There's a lot. Of, a lot of cedar yeah, down and ready. Mommy, look! Mommy, look! So yeah, I'll be helping him with that, and then in exchange, I can bring my own stuff. And I know, it's just well, the thing with rural properties is you guys all can pitch in and, and, and someone can purchase one thing and can help everyone and you yeah. guys can purchase something else. Yeah, and then Osmo is right across the road too. He's got the mural and then uh, Talbot's got like a really cool, like a, it'll, it'll do boards. So you just set it for whatever dimensions and then it runs it through and then pulls your board back and stacks it all for you and it just like... No, it's okay, you can take it. No, it's okay. Done? I don't know. No, he, he, he added I do not know. Okay. Oh, Gord. Gord, yeah. Are we done? Gord lives in that house. Well, uh, yeah. So he if bought it off Cindy. If there's other questions or so anything, engine, I think. That's for sure. that's Does anybody have questions? Yeah. Yeah, do you need, do you want people to come have a work party at your house and help you guys do stuff? It's Maybe I want oh, it is, uh, yeah. it is an option. Yeah. Yeah. We are oh, in okay. Cole, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, and Jaden also, Jaden, you wanted to make it. Jaden and Tyler, too. What? Yeah, Jaden, you wanted to make an announcement about how you're back. Yeah. And then see how it reacts <laughs> with... Yeah, Everybody yeah, here who has yeah. property yeah. needs yeah. some help. Yeah, I'll just take it in one of those here. Yeah, yeah. Tyler's general. putting up a yurt cool. next week on his property uh, up cool. the road. Do you have yeah. the house, yeah. the platform made? I'm not going to make. I'm not going to make. How big is up here? 35. Other stuff. How you... 
Yeah, the plastic. This is how. Mm -hmm. But this so is a, this is a really thick mix right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. cool. It's gonna be hard to spread. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. All right. You know, some of the foundation. Wow, Jay, I'm really. What it is, you can spread it in the form. You can put it back in and remix it with something else. Well, I use lime. Get the cement here to do it. Yeah, trust me, when you finish the art, you can use the wall. Use this one. 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 I almost can't handle the cuteness. Oh, be careful because I was being trolling and I was like, I was like, oh, I could have used that. I was like, 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 I mean, it's good, but. Well, they just don't want overpopulation, right? Yeah. What happened? So now it's got more surface. And then moisture will come out of that. It's going to be dry fast. I put a cement with a poly in it. And so if it flexes, it's going to be. Whoopsie daisies. Reflexes like a cat. But different color. That was a good save. That was like. They used it on the house here. Very good. I don't know if the acrylic would have been out. Maybe JF knows. So same JF. with this one. If you go flat, the thing is, so is you get more texture, right? but you also make it flatter. Do you know if what you they go used steeper, to like that, circle? more angle, no, on then the you can make like it pretty smooth. Oh, too. That'll make it really smooth. It's supposed to be a scratch. More angle, probably stop so recording. So that's too right? much angle. Now really? you're getting yeah. Do you know what they used so on this one? Right? Kind of flat, but with a like you want pressure yeah, there, and then, and then, there you go, that's how it is. And I know it was getting hard. So you're still, you're using, like the like so you're still, you're using the surface of the cement. And you put a cement circle with a little angle. T-A-D-E-L-A-K. It may or may not. It's a lime-based plaster from Morocco. And at some point during the the set of the plaster, you spray it. You miss it. Maybe it will, maybe it will. Uh, I'm not going to say it will. Olive <laughs> soap well, he's actually olive oil. Like, yeah. The amount that he does. And then you burnish then it like with a fine, it's smooth it's stone. Yeah. But it's a very tedious it process like, because you have a stone like, about this big. Wow. And you yeah, have like, to burnish like Mondays, every square like, inch of the surface. Before it sets. Before it sets. And it's with lime. I didn't want to use any lime here because it's Although it will, because we'll just keep going. And then it's intense. There's a chemical reaction of the oil going into the lime. And then it makes a water resistant finish. And so people do that in shower. Uh, and showers just like, and oh, cool. uh, bathrooms. Like when we and, first bought the house. Uh, yeah. There's another way to finish a, a waterproof. Yeah, what's, what's and so, how do you deal with the lime, like, so that you're not future, future you wet rocks? And, and 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 when you're mixing it, but when it's wet like that, it's there's no more dust. So it's it's stable. When you're mixing it, there's a dust. And you're mixing the lime directly into everything. Well, it would instead of using clay as a binder, I'd be using lime. So it ends up lime, a bit of sand. 
Yeah. 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 Then a bit of fiber. The fiber is also if you want to build thickness. Yeah. Well, that's the that's like that much to build the thickness of your plaster. Right. Otherwise, it'd be like the finished plaster. That's why I'm not, I'm using like the fine yeah. fiber for the finish. Right. Oh, sweet. The straw would be uh, would just fine for the for the back. Yeah, because the the fiber the, the straw you would see. And and there's a smell to the straw. I think you probably experienced that too. Like, I love the smell of the wet clay and then the straw. The hempcrete, I liked it in the beginning. I'm getting tired of it. Tired of the smell. The hempcrete. Well, yeah, we Joy was saying she's gonna smell it on her pillow. It's just gross. It's gross. We go. We don't smell it anymore. But we go visit people. <laughs> And all of my sleeping bag, my pillow, everything smells like so hempcrete. Like I'm like, oh. and then we gotta leave the window open. I, I feel bad for the people I'm visiting with, like stinking up their place like that. And then uh, the linseed oil, it also has a smell to it. I know. Like, yeah. Uh, some people might not like it. But I um when I make the paper clay I use vinegar. Yeah, steel is really nice too. I guess steel Yeah. I like the 